Ladies and gentlemen, very welcome to this conference about exercising the right to self-determination and the right to decide in the 21st century. But first of all, I would like to thank very much the distinguished guests who have accepted to come to speak at this conference. From Catalonia, Carlos Puigdemont, and from uh, New Caledonia, Dan Daniel Goa, and Kenneth Clark from Scotland. And this is a great honor to us. No, sorry, Kenneth Gibson. Yes. Kenneth Clark was a different one. <laughs> <laughs> Not quite the same color. <laughs> but anyway, it is a great honor for us to have you as a guest here today. And um, we had expected that you would bring the sunshine from New Caledonia and Catalonia to the Faroes. That didn't happen, but on the other hand, you can see which conditions we have to live under in the Faroe Islands. <laughs> and of course, we will also welcome the chairman of the party, uh, Choelte, the Republican Party in the Faroe Islands, who is organizing this conference, and he will also be the first speaker. But before we get to the uh, first speaker, I can uh, say that we will have um, a short introduction, which I'm going to make. And it will be Högni Hoytal who will take the floor after that, as the first one to open the conference. Then it will be Kenneth Gibson, and then it's Daniel Goa, and then we hope to have room for a small break before Karls Pistemont comes onto the scene. And if there will be time left, we will also have a, a discussion. And there will be possibilities for people also to put forward questions so that we can have a dynamic discussion. I'm going to lead you through this session, but right now I'm going to have a small uh, introduction about uh, the right to self-determination. Oh, sorry. Sorry. We shift the shift button there. Okay. But this introduction will be made in Faroese. But uh, the uh, distinguished guests from outside have a possibility to follow what this introduction is all about because the headlines are on the screen. The old Fiesh Rarshi and the Hamasters Long was at the Jilt, and the two old Fiesh Rarshi and we had. Falka out Kvavi Mashiba Ferrier from Full Welter. Or two in air, you will last I can come till a bit beyond the middle and build a jar of stone up, or Costa Saru to there, or Fanve, or for your life, is called Halta Frameter. Shots out here after he will be neck from me with neck on Chacher. Or who touch a choska belly shots out here after to snooze you on Rattin, Nature Chowun, Shalvar, attack out here, um Gusta Villa Shiba, sir, some shots to land at la some. Land we get a influx of hot malavi on the land, at the upper Aramata ship as we samstar we on the route. Who tells you shots out there at the time we are part of all show of politics we shall have on the fifth hands party on to have our flyers pulling our frame we must go to fleet on our march to Europe. We are currently forced in Wilson. He lay it off from who tells you shots out there out there at some fellows some people we umstrut on urchin. Själv kunde se att han hugsa och gjorde av hur sin landamörsken skulle se ut. Att nu Danmark tog öliga väl undervisning här, då är det den yngste att lämna in efter Sönderjylland och danska rytsen. Och att två grunda länder var så folk är att köra hilten i nyjande och nyjande mån i det här, men så först slöken hundra år sedan. Och ursligt det här att marsch till medlen Danmark till att vara flott sur efter så Sönderjylland efter kom under dansk drej. Hätte wir eis nie ein Pachter auf Grunderland unter Schambanshotmalern und mittlen Ostland und Danmark, so blieb Jörte für just 100 Jahre und dann hat Sotmalen stärfest, dass Ostland wir schieben, so vollwelte wie Felix Kongschuss in Danmark. Da gibt es ein anderes Bild, rund um Hätte, wo wir Schuss aufgehört haben, und hier rund um Dekolonialisierung. Da wird eine neue Aktualität, da ist halt nach Heimskruz entdeckt, so it was very under that our colonial Sierra Chaland. And Lima Land in the West, they were the 5-3 Italian Tour. 
Þegar ég stefast í STE á fundar samtyktum að maður skuldi tryggja öllum tjálandum eða non-self-governing territories rættin til að skipa sig som sjálfstöð land eða eftir fullgóðum fölkarreðisni mannagóndum að tryggja sér kannski hann er að stöðu sem við nefndi Jóhannes með frásann félagskap og gamla tjálandinu eða það vil sía landinu sem hötti tjálandinu þeir bundu sig til að stúla dæmun á hérsæri lægin. Þetta var tvá grunda og hann grunnleikjandi demokratisk rættindi og mannarættindi til sjálfi að gera á sinna framtöð. Tjálanda veldinni, þeir eigu eimæstu tvá hverju tjálanda í hötti sem fingi henda rættin og ákvöldinni seringin hún tók dýka sig í all trússnun og í trússnun. Og tæli á suverénum staðun, það vaks negf þeir næstu tréð við árinu. Men Færjar og Grønland voru ekki sett á henda listan. Það var hínvegin nú í Kaledónia, það var eitt af tæmum London og meðal annað við stöðju í tæri samtyktinu sem það var gjörst og sætni eftir samtyktinu meðal annað nú gjörðu sex trúss og í allt svo var rættin, svo verið hann fölka að hvöfa hildin og í nú í Kaledónia um trúðjú dýjar, þann 4. november, um landið skal skipa sem ein sjálfstöð og tjóð eða ekki. Ég kann svo sýja að verið ekki samtykt tvá svo verið að nútja fölka að hvöfa, með það fyrir að höyra mæ Þið er ein tríða bylgja rundan um sjálfs ágjararattin og um að skipa sig sem súverent land og það er ein bylgja sem kemur í lag þá í Sovjetsamveldi dette sundur og þá í Jugoslavia dette sundur. Þá við kendi í heimsins land rattin hjá eitnum baltalandnum að skipa sig sem sjálfstöð og tjáur við stöðju í allt sjáar rattin og þeir fengi eistinni sú inn límaskap og í eistinn. Síðan er það er það bara nokkur hælt fá land sem er í skipaði sem sjálfstöðu land og nú í einu sjúndi öld svo týkist það sem að ráðju hefur hú að venda og húrinn hjá það mann etablera af landnum að við kenna rattin hjá öðrum tjáun að skipa sig sem sjálfstöðu land er viknaður fyrir ekki að sýja að ráðju gangur í mótin. Það sújar við meðal annað og í Europa og í Europa samveldnum og við sújar það eisni og í eitnu og Kína. Og einu rastefni í Brussell fyrri vikni sem segja að umbó fyrir sem umbóar tjáur og minnilútar sem ekki er vikendir að þeir etablera á landinu þeir tulka allt tjáða sáttmálan um tjáðskapalegan sjálfs að gera rætt sér að smalt og þeir vira hann bera þá það tjánir þar að egni áhvamálun sum til dæmis í Kosovo og Súrsúdan sem voru kann man sía allt tjáða politisk problembæðin. Og hætti hér hefða meðal annað katalanar sannan. Þú í hafast hæ settu sút álit og að Europa fór að tala að það Spania valdi að fara svo hærlega fram um móti demokratisk valdun katalanskun ádvítun svo hörtist ekki eitt kýs úr EU. Og í gjár sveraði danski uttarugisrann og danska tingmann og pelle dragstedt minst trúja fyrr að í Danmark meða við stöðun og Katalónia sem eitt spangst innan rúgismál og því hafa við unga mæning um það. Men hver er tvá víringin fyrir mannarættundun og grunnleggjandi demokratiskun rættundun hjá tjáun sem sjálfi gerir af hvus þeir vilja skipast? Nå, það er ekki eitt. Hvað er það næst slæðna? Ó, hann er komin hann, fyrst. Þið er að mótsetningur meðlum statur og tjóur. Statnir sem hefa sútt umveldi upp að pláss, halda fast upp að sunni mörsk og þið argumentera allt í út frá júra og grunnlóðum. Meðan þeir landnir sem gjarna vilja skipa sig sem fullveldi, þeir argumentera sem regel út frá þeim og politiska sjóna mín. Svo til sænd og súst svo enda tjæðju um sjálfs ágjæri rættin hjá tjóun oftast við að nationalstatinni verja sig við grunnlóunni mót í öllum röndun að flýta mörsk og hýni landnum og svo ræna sörja sér politiskan stúl innan frá og útan frá og lena sig upp að allt tjóða lá fyrir að leggja trúst og að svo þeir kunna vinna sér rættindin til og hvussu er sjálfi að sleppa að taka stöfu til sinni egni framtöð. Við öðrum orðum, svo er þessum spurningurinn ekki bara en spurningur um júra, men er stóra mún um politiska vilja og víring fyrir grunnleikjandi demokratiska rættindun hjá tjóun sem vilja skipa sig sem tjóun. 
Hér sé tingin að kenna við þessi aftur að ferjum. Því mýjan til dömis föringar yfir höfur tala fyrir vukkaðan útanrúðjins politiskun heimildun og annars hafa tala fyrir örum frambúrðun okkuna fram og svo þess að við hafa störri rasarum. Svo við sverri hverja fyrir verið í Danmark að það kann man ekki til danska grunnlofun lauðið í ekki til þann juridiska argumenti sem talar í mátið. Men það að svo við vunnið fram að lægi svo er það því að þeir enda við að blöfa en politisk semja á kortin. Fyrir að landstöðið búið frá í hennar danska rapport til SD í 2006 til að segja að fyrir að hafa fullan sjálfsærgjararatt. Og þið er sjálfandi en tuttningar mér til útmelding. Og þið er ómetalega stóran tuttning að við tæk okkur þann rattin. Men þetta er ein einsúi útmelding til sambar danska undarur í Sráhranun svo Danmark ángantu við er kent fyrir umheimin rattin til að fyrjun að skipa sig sem egna tjóð. Hér veginn svo hafa fleiri forsætisrúðar að sagt að það rokna við að fölkatingi fyrir að vira úrsliði á hann að fölki aðkvöfi fyrir. Hann rokna við að maður fyrir að vira úrsliði á hann að fölki aðkvöfi fyrir. Men það er bara en útsögn frá forsætisrúðarunum og ekki ein skrifli aðtala við millum tvær partar. Skuldið það komið til skarpsjæringar millum partarnar, svo kunna fyrir að þú ekki rokna við stórum stúli úr öðrum London, Þú sveri verið bara að þetta er eitt dangst innlandlendis mál og svo síða og tíða öll heimsins land. Því þetta er eitt internt mál fyrir Danmark að taka stöfu til. Þetta var mún politiska tólking, þetta er ekki ein juridiskur professor sem sveri. Men í dag hafa við svo valt í staðin fyrir að fara inn í hana mæra akademiska diskussjón að fú að fúra politikarar að síða sunna hugsan um rattin til sjálfi að gera af sunna framtíð og hvussu þar vána að land þar að koma vújar fram að fullveldslæg. Öll hafa þeir ímisk eitjennin, men kostni hafa þeir tæta félags að það verja og strújast fyrir sjálfs ærgjöra rattnum eisni og í einu tjúndi öld. Það verður högni sem legg fyrir og svo hann er kennir Gibson sem ég segi í janni. Ég vána sjálfandi að hendan hér rastanan hún kann vukka okkar að sjálfna ring og vera við til að seta spurningin um sjálfs ærgjöra rattin á skrar um rattin sem okkur sjálfun að gera af og við skulle skipa okkur sem sjálfstöfu að tjá eðla upp að annan mat. Takk fyrir og svo fer ég að lata högna hægtal og rétt og svo. Hei þannig brautt er næst, ne? Já. Komandi að þessu ómóð. Takk fyrir að þessum ongri komin hér til þess að halda ég áhverður rastöðnuna. En þú er distinguist guest from abroad. Very welcome to the Faroe Islands. We are honored to have you here from New Caledonia, Scotland and Catalonia. And hope we will have a prosperous conference. I will just say some words in Faroese and then I will go over to English. Og allt som ég har fyrir að fyrir að gjögna sinta föröskur söfuna, lægina framma sem Ég sú kjenna við sem við tjóðal, sú kjenna við skal sjá hann að enda að ég veit að við fyrjun er við ymsa meiningar um bæði um það sögulig útlægingina og hvussi við vil koma vújari af fram, svo það mótið það mótið hafa leggja þegnu djæma sjá hann það ég leggja þetta fram og það skal ég sinn gera vart við mótvegis okkara utlensku gestum. So, ladies and gentlemen, I will try to go briefly through the Faroese case of self-determination and independence. And as I stated in the Faroese, uh, in the Faroe Islands there is not consensus about the interpretation of history and so on. So this will be my interpretation and my party's interpretation. So just uh, have that in mind when, when, you, when you should interpret what, what happens in Faroese politics. Um, so the Faroese case of um, self-determination. I will start with some myths. Uh, it is said in our midst that the Faroe Islands were inhabited by Norwegian people that fled from Norwegian kings and Norwegian taxes. And they fled from Norway in boats westwards. Some went to the Faroe Islands, some went to Iceland, according to the myth. We now know perhaps that's not the right uh, historical uh, fact, but that's according to the myths. Um, so they went from Norway. Icelanders proclaim that they first arrived in the Faroe Islands. All the seasick people were put, went off in the Faroe Islands, while those who wanted to become independent and strong, <laughs> they went on to Iceland. Uh, we don't fully agree 
we claim that all the Norwegian people try to find the Faroe Islands, the paradise on Earth, but only the best navigators could find these islands, while the rest have to just to, to go with the, with the tide to Iceland. So that's according to the myths. Uh, today, of course, we see ourselves as a large ocean nation in the middle of the North Atlantic, as New Caledonia is. If we take the Faroe Islands as land and uh, exclusive economic zone, we are actually a large nation. And in our opinion, I think I can speak for every Faroe East, we have every possibility to, to, um, to have a prosperous nation here in the middle of the North Atlantic. But we do not agree upon the constitutional uh, issue. Um, and to go briefly through my interpretation of the Faroe's constitutional uh, position, uh, we, could, we could claim that uh, uh, the Faroe Islands have always had its own parliament uh, and has been an, uh, its own judici judici judicial entity. Um, uh, we also claim that we have the, have the oldest parliament in the world. I know there are many claims about that, but we have good records for that. Um, and throughout the Viking Ages and, and uh, into the Middle Ages, uh, the Faroe Islands made agreements with Norwegian kings uh, uh, and were connected to Norway in one way or another. They, the Danish and the Norwegian formed a union. That's the first connection to Denmark. When, uh, when uh, Norway, uh, after, after the Napoleonic Wars, Norway um, became a part of a, a union with Sweden, Iceland, Faroe Islands and Greenland were left together with Denmark. And in my opinion, uh, the history from about 1800 has been a history of, uh, of where, where Denmark has, a plan to, has, has its plan to integrate, even assimilate the Faroe Islands into the Danish unitary nation-state, uh, both politically, uh, in cultural terms, economical and in administration. And that was what actually also uh, initiated the national movement in the Faroe Islands first and foremost on the cultural basis, that we would have our own language, but also a question of, of building a, f a modern Faroese nation in Faroese, in Faroese culture and with Faroese political institutions. And that went on to Second World War, which changed, changed everything. We were occupied by Britain, while Denmark, as you know, were occupied by Germany. So after that, there, there was a whole new um, uh, question of Faroese independence, we had practically been independent during the Second World War. So, briefly, it resulted in a referendum on independence in 1946. Uh, there was a small majority pro-independence, but even though the Home Rule Act was uh, introduced in 1948 without a new referendum, uh, and also in my political interpretation, this was a very special referendum. Uh, this was a referendum where you should either, you should uh, choose to accept a Danish uh, offer to be, have some kind of home rule, kind of integration in Denmark, or you should choose full independence. And I think most people uh, thought that this would scare the fairest people to vote for the first, to integration in Denmark. But there was a small majority, as you see here, uh, 400, uh, there was a small majority pro-independence, and I think that was very crucial for the future of the Faroe Islands. Um, because with that, we also maintained the right to self-determination. In my interpretation, if we had, vote, if we had voted for the Danish uh, offer, we would have been integrated into the Danish state uh, after the Second World War. I'll come back to that. Today, I think I can speak for everyone in the Faroe Islands that we agree upon that we fulfill all criteria as a people with the right to self-determination, both according to history, language, identity, political institutions, borders, ability to uphold democratic rights, and so on. Um, I also claim that the Faroese people has never accepted or voted pro-integration in the Danish state, or pro the Danish constitution. Uh, and we also claim that the Faroese people are subject to international law, of course. And Magnus mentioned it, the UN Charter and the covenants uh, upon political, economical rights and human rights 
state very clearly that all peoples have the right of self-determination. By virtue of that right, they can freely de determine their political status and freely pursue their economic, social and cultural development. And all peoples, you know, you know this, may for their own ends freely dispose of their national wealth and so on. And the state parties uh, to the present covenant, including those having responsibility for administration of non self governing and trust territories, shall promote the realization. This is, this is stated by my party, this is, there is not consensus about all this in the, Faroes, in, 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 in the whole of Faroes politics. Um, but as Mike Buck mentioned, uh, we have been pressed between international law and Danish law for many years. The Faroes people were never listed on the UN in accordance to decolonization and never listed on the, on the list of, uh, of, non, uh, of people with, that has not exercised their, their right to self-determination. And in my opinion, the referendum in 1946 was actually a vote on integration into the Danish state. I think that Denmark had foreseen the, what happened in the UN. Uh, Magda mentioned that, that Greenland was in a quite different position. Uh, they were actually listed first on the list of uh, peoples that had right to self-determination, but later they were, uh, they went off the list when they were integrated in, in, into the Danish constitution without a referendum. So in my opinion, the majority for independence and rejection of the integration of the Danish state has been the basis for the ongoing independence process in the Faroe Islands. Um, but still, as, as, as Magna mentioned, Danish constitution is still used as an absolute framework for all various rights, also when we debate with Denmark on the process of independence. They say it has to be done according to the Danish constitution and so on, not according to international law. Well, in my opinion, the power of self-determination uh, is huge, not only in the Faroe Islands, I think it's, it's, uh, it's to say for all parts of the world. In my opinion, the uh, the process towards self-determination and independence has been the basis of modernization and development in the Faroe Islands, both cultural, socially, economical and political. Um, I also believe it has been the, the basis of responsibility, democracy and slowly to build our international relations. And I still think it's the basis for the ongoing development of the Faroe Islands as a democratic modern nation in the world. Um, so I still think that the that decision by the Faroes people in 1946, and I could also add when Denmark joined the EU, that we voted to stay outside, I think that has been the basis for our possibilities to still develop this, uh, this nation as a modern nation of the world today. And just as an example, uh, we can debate if the Faroes are subject to international law, and we have talked about the Carlos a bit, but only in fisheries, uh, we have agreements with all our neighbors. We uh, take part in international bodies um, that uh, administrates some of these huge resources of the North Atlantic and so on and so on. And I don't think this, is, this would have been possible if we hadn't had this process and if we had joined the EU. In the 21st century, there has been some developments in Faroe's independence process. Uh, and uh, in the year 2000, there were ne negotiations with uh, the Danish government on a treaty of free association. Basically, a kind of a union where we should still have the same king as head of state or queen uh, and have some rights between Faroes and Danish citizens. But there was no agreement. Uh, there was planned a referendum which was abolished. After that, uh, Different governments have tried to, to have, have tried to reduce the economic dependency and to take power of all areas of democracy slowly. And actually, you could state that today it's mainly uh, uh, the police, the courts, and it's the the actual power of foreign policy that is still Danish, while we, we actually have the have the powers of all other, on all other matters in the Faroe Islands. Uh, We've also been working since the year 2000 on the Ferris Constitution. It has not been um, applied yet by Parliament. It has not been to a referendum. There was planned a referendum this year, and it has been postponed. Um, so again, in my opinion, 
Um, the way forward, and this is speaking for my party and for, for, for myself, I think the way forward is, uh, is to the Ferris people to, uh, to apply a Ferris constitution where we state the right to self-determination and the rights of the citizens and state in the process of establishing the Ferris state by, by referendum. That is stated in, in the constitution how you should go forward to, to establish a Ferris state. Um, the way forward is also ongoing connections to all relevant international fora of cooperation as a subject to international law. And of course, to still ongoing establish all democratic and, and political structures in the Faroe Islands that can uphold the rights of the citizens and the equal rights of citizens of this nation. And then the Faroe people can decide to have a referendum on full independence when we have uh, first applied the Ferris Constitution. This has been the plan for, for some years, for, for in, in some parts of the political process, but we haven't uh, reached that point yet. Well, the right of self-determination in the 21st, 21st century, Martin mentioned it as a, as a framework. We had the Wilson Doctrine uh, after the, the First World War, then the UN Charter and the Covenants after the Second World War, the decolonization in the 1950s, 60s and perhaps 70s, the dissolvement of the Soviet Union. But now we have the question of how to cope with globalization in the 21st century. And in my opinion, even though we have the establishment of rights according to international law, we are still in the gap between the power of rights or the rights of powers. Uh, so despite all international law and vision of rights, it's still the power of the old nation states determining the outcome and development of these rights. And we see it in different, uh, in, in, with different hard powers or soft powers, but this is still the question for, I think, for all our nations here. Um, in my opinion, we should focus on that self-determination um, and development of our nation in the 21st century is all about democracy. And we have to address that the, the narrative of secession and instability and isolation and so on from the old nation states when we debate uh, independence in the 21st century, we have to go against that. Because that is still the old paradigm, uh, which is the basis of international and European debate today. Uh, but we have to focus that Self-determination in the 21st century has to be about democracy and responsibility in the globalized world. And this should be the foundation of all debates and uh, decisions on, on this matter. And I believe that the ability and responsibility to form democratic societies and uphold the rights of the people are core to this process. And the ability and responsibility to fulfill and develop international agreements and international cooperation is the basis for the self-determination in the 21st century. And I believe that there are, there are nations present here today and also uh, in other parts of the world that can fulfill this and can take active part in an interdependent world. That must be the vision of, uh, of the international society in the future. And I should hope also in Europe, even though I think uh, that, has, that has very dim prospects at the moment. And I firmly believe that when we, when we go forward with self-determination in the 21st century, that that can also be the basis for peace, prosperity and international development when we acknowledge that also new nations uh, on the global, uh, on the global uh, arena can take part in the globalization and the international agreements and work for the peace, prosperity and international development of the whole world. So I believe that we should reverse the narrative and not always become in, in a defense position where we should say, why will you be independent? But we shall ask, why not? Why shouldn't we be independent if we are able to do this and take part of the world with responsibility? That is uh, that's actually uh, my vision for the future. And I hope that this conference also will lead to some, uh, some um, concrete results on that matter. Just to conclude, here we are. I mentioned that the Faroe Islands are, we, we call ourselves a large, large ocean nation. And actually the at the moment the Faroe Islands are also claiming the right, 
Over there? Well, Liot, Baka. Oh, it doesn't matter. Just to conclude, that we are also claiming the right to, uh, to a huge area of the South Atlantic uh, area. And of course, when we, uh, when we come to that, we will also uh, act according to all international uh, responsibilities on that matter. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Högni Hoydal, for a very good uh, presentation. Um, we have an um, opening for some questions, and here on the front row we have some people from the Fairways University as well who are not necessarily affiliated to our party, so they have the possibility to come forward with um, critical questions. Please do so. How are you doing? Yeah, yeah. Thank you for your presentation. It was very interesting. Uh, my question will be: um, uh, If you don't think that uh, uh, the independence movement in the Faroe Islands has focused too much on or been too hopeful about what international law can deliver in this uh, matter, because I mean, uh, when the when the independence coalition in year 2000 went to Copenhagen to negotiate for independence, as we all know, uh, the Danes were pretty unimpressed by the self-determination uh, exactly. argument. And uh, and uh, as late as uh, this year, uh, the Danish foreign minister has uh, answered uh, Magni Arke that uh, our we have a right, I, I interpret it as some kind of political or moral right to self-determination, but uh, they, they think it's irrelevant as, as, uh, as, uh, from an international legal perspective. So my question is if we shouldn't just uh, focus more on the political uh, part of the question, see it as a political struggle and, and uh, play it down the international legal argument a bit. Well, thank you, Bar. I, uh, I do not quite agree. Uh, I don't think it's a matter of, of either or. I think that what we experienced, experienced in, in, uh, in the negotiations in the year 2000 was that it was impossible to have a negotiation on, equal, uh, on any equal basis as long as Denmark didn't acknowledge a right to self-determination. Uh, so I think that the, the rights according to international law is also a basis for civilized uh, uh, negotiation because we have always acknowledged that we should negotiate with Denmark on a civilized uh, treaty. Um, and I, I would reverse the question and say, why, why shouldn't Denmark acknowledge our right to self determination? What, what is the basis for, for why they don't do that? And why? No, no, that's, that's my question to the Danish government, that's been so often. And I, haven't, I have never got an answer. Why, why weren't the Faroe Islands put on the list in, in 1946? No question, because then there was a plan to, to integrate us. Uh, and I, th I think that will just be uh, uh, to the honor of Denmark if they did so, and also uh, negotiate with the Faroe Islands where then, when there's a majority to do so, based upon international law. That would, in my opinion, also create a more civilized debate here in the Faroe Islands. Uh, because we know that the debate also is, is always uh, based upon fear and isolation and so on. I think that would lift the debate in the Faroe Islands up to a new level. And still, uh, the vision of, of Faroe's independence is also a vision of taking part of the world. So, so why shouldn't we deal with this as an internal Danish matter? I, I have never understood. Please. Barry? Just to supplement the question, uh, I totally agree that we, we are in need of international law in this area, but uh, as a matter of fact, we don't have international law in this area. I mean, it's, it's a matter of mainstream international law that only so-called non-self-governing territories have the right to external self-determination and, and, and implicitly a right to secession uh, inherent in that. And the Faroe Islands has never gotten the status as a non-self-governing uh, uh, entity or a territory. And, and, and I don't see any strategy from the Faroe side to, to, to argue for that position. 
And all the parties in the Faroe Islands, except the old self-governing party, are electing uh, representatives to the Danish parliament. And if there's one feature in an arrangement that counts against being uh, yes. viewed as a colony or non-self-governing territory, that's exactly participating in the, in the yeah. metropolitan uh, political system and electing your representatives to their parliament. With all the, the respect for what you are doing in the Danish parliament. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, I partly agree, Bar. Uh, there, there are contradictions in many of our uh, dispositions also as political parties. Uh, also, when our party participates in, in um, uh, election to the Danish parliament, uh, the first year we didn't do so. It was mostly for pragmatic reasons and to, to have the independence issue on the agenda. Uh, so there are contradictions there, but still, I believe that also, with all the history between the Faroe Islands and Denmark, what, what should be the problem that Denmark acknowledged the Faroe Islands as a, um, um, uh, according to international law? The Faroe's government uh, at that time, uh, with Jonas Eidskot as Prime Minister, sent a letter to Denmark that was sent to the UN, but it was never acknowledged by the Danish government. So why not? I think that will be the next step to, to civilize this process even more and also to reduce fear in the Faroe Islands for this process. It is not a question of, uh, of um, isolation and, and econ economic disaster. It can be a question of, of modern development in the globalized world. We have uh, room for uh, a question more. Yeah. Would you present yourself? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Ilan, Ilan Kiloy. I'm from the Solomon Islands and is part of the delegation from New Caledonia. Thank you very much, sir, for the presentation. It's just a question of interest uh, from our part. Uh, you mentioned in your slide, which is really clear on how international law interacts with um, domestic law uh, here in Faroe. And just a point of interest as to the conflict between international law and uh, domestic law and how uh, does it play out? Uh, I think it's in a question of interest on in how uh, to contrast in uh, the case of New Caledonia where there is a new mayor code that uh, complements the process for decolonization. Mm. And so just from that perspective uh, for our information and uh, so that we can see how international law uh, is in conflict with uh, the domestic law and what exactly, exactly is the main uh, point of conflict or the issue. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much. I, uh, I don't have a clear answer to that, of course, but we can state that you are, you, you can state your as a, yourself as a subject to international law according to, to the UN Charter and to the, to the covenants and so on. Uh, and as I understand, you have also conflicts with domestic law on that matter. Uh, but but I, we will hear about it later, but I, I believe there's no dispute about your right to self-determination. Uh, and there still is some kind of that in, in, in the Danish constitution. It's still a constitution for a unitary state. Uh, and uh, when we debate with the Danes, they, they still claim that the Danish constitution is the sole basis for all rights of the Faroe's people also to uh, independence. They have stated that they will accept independence. Uh, and I believe they will, uh, even though I think that the biggest fear of Danish government is that Faroe's independence will lead to Greenlandic independence. Because there are still huge interests, especially in the Arctic and so on. Um, so this is still a dispute here, but as I believe in your case, uh, it's, it's undispute, undisputed that you have the right to self-determination and can choose for yourselves. And that is still di disputed here. Thank you. Okay, one last uh, question. Uh, could you uh, comment on whether there would have been a different position for the Faroe Islands in the negotiations with Denmark uh, back in the year 2000 about uh, independence or a free association uh, if we had this right of self-determination accepted by Denmark and announced to the international society? Yes, I firmly believe so. Uh, not only for the climate of the negotiations, but also to, to, the, 
to the question of, um, of, of equality when we negotiated, because we were constantly met with the demands, the, 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 all the uh, demands from the Danish government were based upon the Danish constitution, and also when we debated the big issue of, uh, of a civilized economical uh, transition period and so on, I think that uh, the acknowledgement of the Faroe Islands or the Faroe people as a subject to international law would also have led to better negotiations because then we would also have, have the possibility to, to have a mediator from international uh, bodies if, if that was possible. Um, I can just add to that, uh, when we went to, to the negotiation in the year 2000, we used Iceland as an example. They gained independence precisely 100 years ago, in, also in a kind of a free association. Um, and uh, we experienced that that, that, was not, uh, that was not very good for the negotiations because the Danes still felt that, they, that Iceland had, had not uh, been respectful to Denmark when they finally uh, uh, made their own republic in the, during the Second World War. Uh, so there are many also historical conflicts in, in, the, in the negotiations. Uh, and, but still, I think it would create a better image for Denmark, um, uh, a more honourable uh, entrance to the whole negotiation if we had this, this question cleared for, from the first time, yes. Hagni Heidel, time is up and we will have a chance to put forward some questions when the debate is coming on. Thank you to Hagni Heidel. Should we give him an applause? <laughs> Our next speaker is from Scotland. Scotland has very much been on the agenda in Faroes where we have followed the independence referendum back in 2014. And the whole of UK is very much on the radar here in the North Atlantic and elsewhere in Europe because of the Brexit. And that has also sparked and ignited two new discussions in Scotland about independence and referendum and things like that. And uh, out of Scotland, our, from our nearest neighbour is Kenneth Gibson. He was elected to the very first Scottish parliament, uh, parliament in 1999, in modern times, and he has served in the parliament for 19 years. And uh, the floor is yours, Kenneth. Okay, well, thank you uh, very much, Magni, and also thank you to Hogney. And I have to say, I've never used one of these uh, pieces of technology before, so I hope you can all hear me loud and clear. And first of all, I want to thank uh, my Faroese hosts for their kindness and for inviting me here as a representative of the, of the Scottish Parliament and the Scottish National Party to speak to you today. Um, uh, I share your disappointment that uh, Charles and Daniel were unable to bring uh, the weather from their countries, but I brought the weather from my country. <laughs> <laughs> I've actually been very fascinated by this nation uh, of the Faroe Islands for many years, and in fact, on the 12th of July, in my Facebook page, I posted Faroese Nation, uh, a 30-minute documentary that you may have seen, which uh, many people in Scotland find inspirational about life here uh, uh, in uh, the Faroes and how that inspires us in Scotland. So this is a, a two-way process. Little did I understand at that time that only three months later I would be here in the Faroes for the first time ever speaking to you. Now, normally I speak about 180 words a minute. Because of my Scottish accent, I will try and speak a little bit more slowly so that you can understand me. So, we meet today during one of the most tumultuous periods of UK and, by extension, Scottish politics. The chaos and uncertainty which has consumed Westminster following the 2016 referendum on leaving the European Union threatens to inflict serious and lasting harm on the lives of people across Scotland. Not content with failing to rebuild the economy after the economic collapse delivered by their Labour predecessors, the UK Tory government uh, will deepen that hardship by delivering an economically nonsensical uh, Brexit. Uh, 
which in our view would be nothing short of disaster for Scotland with an anticipated 80,000 jobs lost and the door closed on the talented EU workers who support our economy, around 173,000 at present. This means a smaller, weaker, poorer Scottish economy, the exact opposite of what voters were promised by the UK government in 2014 when they were actually told that unless they voted no, Scotland would be thrown out of um, the European Union uh, during the independence referendum. Of course, we in Scotland didn't vote for the Tory government. We hadn't voted Conservative in Scotland since 1955. Uh, we didn't vote for the referendum on leaving the European Union, and we didn't vote for Brexit. And in that referendum, 62% of people in Scotland voted to remain within the European Union. And we certainly did not vote to crash out of the European Union with no deal. Nevertheless, the SNP, and we have 35 members of the United Kingdom Parliament, has engaged constructively with each step of the Brexit process. Our MPs at Westminster, and I have to say my wife is one of them, have proven themselves willing to find solutions that work for Scotland, but have been largely ignored. When the Scottish Parliament was urged to grant consent for Prime Minister Theresa May's EU withdrawal bill, the Scottish Parliament decisively rejected that by 93 votes to 30. Not only the 63 Scottish National Party MSPs supported it, but also Labour, Liberal Democrat and Green MSPs also. Uh, and the reason was because it would return 24 EU powers to the UK government post-Brexit. And many of these powers are intertwined with devolved powers, powers that Scotland has already. These powers include those over state aid for industry, genetically modified crops policy, fishing quotas and farm subsidies. All of it should rightfully be on Scotland's hands. Anything less than returning these is a Westminster power grab and a shameless one at that. At Westminster, the UK government showed contempt for the devolved parliaments of Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland as the EU withdrawal bill was pushed through without a single thought to the views of our devolved parliaments. This demonstrates that Westminster is not negotiating in good faith with the Scottish Parliament over Brexit and the wider Scottish public is not blind to this. That being said, what are the possible outcomes of Brexit? We could stay in the EU the way things are going, which is what Scotland voted for. We could be forced to leave. But the only sensible evidence-led option in our view is to stay in the single market and the customs union, even if we do leave. But should we be forced down the no deal route, then the dislocation will be sudden, cumulative and long-lasting. Some suggest, although I personally believe it alarmist, that we will experience shortages because of customs delays, which will doubtless cause difficulties for businesses which export or rely on complex supply chains. It mean a reduction in crucial investment from outside Scotland, a fortress mentality from a hostile UK government likely to see devolution as disposable. There remains also the Prime Minister's checkers proposals, which leave no one much the wiser as to what the terms of exit are or what the terms will be of any future relationship. To lay matters out plainly, if there is no offer and no possibility, at the very least, of a single market and customs union outcome, either for the UK as a whole or for Scotland as a differentiated part of it, then there is no meaningful option offered at all and no option that can or will have SNP support. Of course, it's simply a fact that those keenest on Brexit are those who dislike Scotland having a parliament the most. Their voices are loud and held, heard at the heart of the UK government. They regard anything that interferes with the so-called sovereignty of Westminster as dangerous and unacceptable. They want rid of voices that speak of modern democracy, modern constitutions and modern trading agreements. Of course, regardless of the machinations and manoeuvres taking place in London and Brussels, the job of the SNP as a party and in government is to both make sure that Scotland flourishes no matter the circumstances we find ourselves in, but also to ensure that at the right moment the choice of independence can be made. I say at the right moment, not the most comfortable moment or the moment that best relieves our natural impatience for change, but the moment at which our country is persuaded, ready and determined to win. The Scottish Parliament has a mandate for independence and indeed a majority of MSPs voted 69 to 59 last year to authorise the Scottish Government to request a transfer of powers from the UK Parliament to hold a second referendum. 
Voters in 2014 could never have anticipated the chaos we're now in just four years down the line, and they deserve another chance to decide Scotland's future, given the changing political and economic landscape that Brexit has brought. Our vision is to build on the powers of the Scottish Parliament and build on a record of achievement in government, whilst also showing people just what Scotland could achieve with the powers of independence. Sharing experience and knowledge with nations such as the Faroe Islands is a key part of that. We have a shared interest. After all, Faroese mitochondria are 84% Celtic female, the Y chromosome 87% Scandinavian male, that proves that Faroese Vikings raided Scotland and Ireland for women. <laughs> I'm glad you're now a wee bit better behaved. As a member of the SNP's new campaigns committee, uh, which is, is uh, number seven of us, uh, chaired by SNP Deputy Leader Keith Brown, MSP, we are already laying the foundations for a future independence campaign. We are mobilising the SNP's vast membership base of 125,000, which is bigger than the UK Tory party, and designing new campaign materials and exploring new engaging ways of communicating to help attract new supporters to the cause of independence. We've hosted three national assemblies across Scotland, which proved to be a great platform to discuss economic policy. There have been demands for further events of this format and we will explore taking this forward in future weeks and months. Thirteen days ago, we had a national day of action when our activists went out uh, and knocked doors, uh, um, held street stalls and spoke to voters. And last Saturday, we had a, a march through Edinburgh uh, with over 100,000 people participating, uh, calling for independence. Now, when I was just a boy, I went on an independence march and there were 300 of us. 300, now 100,000. So things have moved forward dramatically just in my lifetime. So we're on a campaign footing and putting forward our vision for a positive future for Scotland. A Delta Poll survey only this month found that uh, Brexit would tip public opinion in Scotland towards independence, with 47% of Scots in favour of independence, 43% against, and 10% who did not know votes up for grabs. This is a fight the SNP can and will win. Finally, I'm joining you uh, today fresh from our party conference in Glasgow, which concluded on Tuesday after three days of exciting, engaging policy and campaign discussions. The theme of the conference, which we had 4,000 delegates at, was hope. Many announcements emerged from conference, demonstrating that we are moving towards an ever fairer Scotland, doing what we can with the powers that we have now. We heard from our First Minister that Scotland will put fair work first by extending fair work criteria such as a living wage to as many funding streams of business support grants as possible, meaning public money will support business which pay workers fairly, promote secure contracts and eliminate the gender pay gap. We heard from the Finance Secretary Derek Mackay that legislation to introduce, introduce Scotland's new National Investment Bank will be brought forward next year with a commitment to capitalise the bank with £2 billion around 16 billion Danish crowns. We heard about a new infrastructure commission which will advise on investment priorities and importantly explore the feasibility of government-owned national infrastructure company. We are building a new Scotland, a Scotland for all, but we could do so much more free of the chaos and incompetence of Westminster. How much more hope will be possible when we take Scotland's future into Scotland's hands and become an independent country, we ask. It is our duty it is our ambition and it is our vision to build an independent Scotland and an independent Scotland works for all. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, you will not escape this um, place until you had some questions, okay? That's why I'm still here. By yeah. Thank you. I uh, yes. just want to continue from uh, the question of Hogni Hoytal or with, uh, with, uh, with in, rel in relation to Scotland. Are you satisfied in Scotland that uh, your the basis for your right to self determination is internal to to the British legal system, or or do uh, or uh, does the international legal aspect enter your debate? Or, or 
Um, well, the international legal aspect doesn't really enter our debate. First of all, Scotland mm. has its own legal system, which it has had mm. uh, since before the 1707 Act of Union. When Scotland and England united, they spent so many centuries trying to conquer Scotland. Eventually, the King of Scotland became King of England, and the two parliaments merged. So it was a kind of Scottish takeover, if you think about it. Um, <laughs> when our parliaments merged in 1707, there were two main criteria. Our legal system remained intact, and I know that's a major issue here in Faroes, because police and justice are under the control of Scotland, and I realise that they're not yeah. under control here. And secondly, our education system uh, uh, remained under Scottish control. We had four universities when England had two, etc., etc. So, first country in the world with three education. So, um, it, so the position uh, within the United Kingdom is, is, uh, has been clearly set out because we had the Edinburgh Agreement before the 2014 referendum, which recognised that Scotland does have a right to uh, independence and uh, decide its own future. What the United Kingdom government is saying at the moment is that because of the Brexit negotiations and the the fact that there's civil war within the Conservative Party and indeed the Labour Party uh, as well over this particular issue. Um, uh, if I'll give you just one little aside. The Labour Party's policy is constructive ambiguity to Brexit. What that means is we, we make people think who, who vote leave think we want to vote leave, we support leave, and people who remain we want them to think we support remain. So, but anyway, the, 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 the overall situation in the United Kingdom is that the UK government has said not while Brexit negotiations are ongoing, and we accept that, that position. Uh, but of, because, because our own parliament has already voted that we can have a referendum, we have an electoral mandate, mandate our party get the highest share of the vote of any political party in Europe at the last election, 47%. Uh, then we can call that referendum, and my own view is that it should be called in the, uh, around about this time next year. It should be called and held around about this time next year. Um, one thing I would say is the difference between Scotland, and I had this debate in Catalonia a decade ago when I was out speaking there, is we have only one national party. All views, left wing, right wing, liberal, whatever, are all under the one umbrella because the, for us the most important issue is independence for Scotland and therefore we have one united voice. That makes a big difference because in Westminster elections where it's first past the post we can destroy any generally any unionist party because they're split whereas we can if with 45% 40, of the vote in any constituency can win almost anywhere. So um, that is very important having a unified voice. I know that's not easy here but well, that's how we have been able to build our party and put independence on the front foot. So, a long-winded answer, but I hope it, it, um, that answers some of your question. One other thing I would say is, I realise you, you, you made the point about Faroese politicians going in to the Reichstag in, in, in Copenhagen. Um, I'm not just saying it because my wife is a member of the Westminster Parliament, but there are so many issues that are, that are dealt with at the United Kingdom level. I'll just mention, uh, well, there's so many, everything, welfare, foreign policy, but let's just suggest Trident. The United Kingdom government wants to spend £200 billion, pounds, that's 1,600 billion Danish <laughs> crowns, on a new nuclear missile system. Uh, we, our MPs have to be in Westminster to vote against that, to make sure people know that Scotland doesn't want that, not just because it would be based in Scotland, but we don't want nuclear weapons anywhere. So it's, we think it's important that, our, uh, that we have members of parliament in there giving Scotland's voice. Otherwise, we would have unionist politicians who do not represent Scotland um, uh, deciding for us. Don't be shy. Don't be I shy. Bite. God, look at this. The descendants of Vikings. Come what? on. While, while, while they're gaining power to put forward more <laughs> questions, yeah. could, could you elaborate a little bit on how come that it has developed from this first march of yours with 300 people has raised to 100,000 in a it, fairly it's, short it's actually, term? Well, it's quite astonishing. I joined the SNP. The SNP um, was formed in uh, 1934 and it was a very much a fringe movement. So what happened there, the, the United, right, our education system is, is Scottish, but was dominated by United Kingdom history. So when we were taught school, we were only taught English history, never Scottish history or anything about Scotland, blah, blah, blah. So there was a very strong um, unionist British mentality in Scotland. Scotland, there was an attempt after the union to rename Scotland North Britain. 
England was still England, but Scotland was North Britain. So when I was a boy, you had the North British Railway Company and the North British Hotel, all these North British things, right? Uh, but after the Second World War, there was a kind of small movement for what was called um, uh, a, a kind of S Scottish Parliament. And uh, it got two million signatures. Um, and it was presented to Westminster. And Winston Churchill said, the only way you will get a parliament is if you win elections. And so our party, which at that time had people from all political persuasions and all parties, you could be in the Labour Party, Conservative Party, Communist Party, whatever it happened to be. Communist Party was big, of course, in those days. All these parties you could, and being the SNP, so then we decided you could only be a member of the SNP and no other political party. So 90% of people left, and the small group that were left were dedicated to pushing forward the independence idea. We didn't have any newspapers or radio stations. In 1959, we had only two candidates in, for parliament out of 71 constituencies. And gradually, bit by bit, bit by bit, speaking to people, knocking doors, we built up and built up and built up and built up. And, um, and then, we, so the pressure for the Scottish Parliament, the, the unionist parties, Conservative and Labour thought if they promise uh, a kind of Dengeld idea, if you promise uh, the Scottish people a wee parliament, then they won't want any more. Uh, so we had a referendum in 1997 to have the re-establishment of the Scottish Parliament. 75% of people supported that, and our parliament was re-established in 1999. And since then, we have always seen devolution as um, a process, not an event. So it's not just Scotland gets these powers and that's it. We are always trying to build on those powers and get more and more, more and more powers devolved to us, as indeed the pharaohs is. So, so we've just built up, and and, uh, and, and what happened in nineteen in two thousand fourteen was astonishing. Our party had about twenty five thousand members. After the referendum, the Conservative and Labour parties had worked together, age old enemies of left and right, and it was seen by a huge proportion of the people of Scotland that these parties were working against Scotland and so after the referendum was narrowly lost our membership went from um, 25,000 to over 100,000 in a week. Thousands of people, 10,000 people a day joined the party and the Westminster elections uh, we went from having six MPs out of 59 to 56 out of 59. We swept all the unionists away. Um, it, places that had voted Labour for 70 years were transformed. Our vote was going, and my constituency, um, the, the vote went for our party from like 20, 50 percent almost overnight. So you can achieve, you can move mountains if the political, if the, the political mood, mood music is correct and you have the right message. And it has to be positive, it has to be engaging, it has to be visionary. Um, we did make mistakes in that referendum. I don't want to drone on too long, but. One of the things I said this morning was our party leader thought we should have a three-year referendum campaign. All that did was allow all the opposition to mobilise against us. Uh, when they had the Brexit referendum, it was three months, and the Brexit campaigners, it wasn't called by the Leavers, but it was won by the Leavers, because it was, it was about their vision, not a vision that I necessarily agreed with, but it, there was a vision that went through, so it's about the vision that matters rather than the fine detail. We produced a 700-page document about how an independent Scotland would look, and all that happens is they go to page 321 and say, what about that? And page 275, what about that? So it's about the vision thing, you know, self-determination, uh, putting your own future in your own hands, you deciding for yourself, not your next-door neighbour, even if they're the nicest neighbour. And as I said this morning, just one last thing I'll say, is our party leader always used to say, it's better to have a friendly neighbour than a surly lodger. In other words, it's better to have someone who lives next door to you and is your best friend, and pharaohs would be best friends to Denmark, than have someone who is perhaps unhappy. So, um, and we, 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 we like English people. I mean, they're the closest to us in terms of history, sense of humour, language. We do like them. We just don't want to have their parliament run our country. We have uh, another question here. Hello, yeah, my name is Jek Van. Um, let's say you have an, another independence referendum. Let's say you win. Let's say you establish an independent Scottish state. Yay! <laughs> yeah. I can retire. But by then, you're well and truly outside the European Union. Yeah. 
So what happens then? Yeah, that's a and really. The, I want so, to point out we're outside the EU. Yeah. As is Norway, as is Iceland. Yeah. At the moment, our party position is very clear. We don't want to leave the European Union. There's a whole number of reasons for that. Because, um, but I think we would have to decide on the circumstances. Then, I mean, it's not you know you can't really say oh we'll just we'll just argue to come back in again. I think we would have to look at the circumstances at that point. I think that's quite clear what we would do. I think the the mood in our party is that we'd prefer to stay in, and most people in our party would prefer to go back in if we were not in the European Union and have to go through that probably tedious process of joining. But it may be that one if there's one, two, three, four years elapsed, we think, do you know what? We can do perfectly well without outside the European Union. I think the economic shock would be initial, but I think after that it would be that perhaps we could uh, survive and thrive outside the European Union. I don't see any, any reason why not, to be perfectly honest with you. Uh, I, I always think, I was again, I was saying this morning, um, independence is not a miracle cure. I mean, you know, many countries have become independent with, with no resources, you know. I mean, for example, Singapore, whatever you think of the, of the, of the, the democratic structures here, has become an economic titan in the world with... Uh, the Ukraine has become a, a poverty-stricken backwater despite having phenomenal resources. It's about the quality of people you elect and the policies they take forward. But at the end of the day, any decision you make yourself has got to be better than someone else making it. And again, I, I always point out to people when I'm chatting to ordinary people on the doorstep, I always say, any country that's got independence has never surrendered that afterwards. They don't say, do you know what? I don't like taking these decisions. Going to you take them. You know what I mean? It's, 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 it, to me, it's just a, a sensible, straightforward thing. And more and more people are coming to realise that, you know. Uh, and I think most people in the Faroes are, though, will feel liberated when they have their own country. I mean, to, be, to stand on your own stage. Even last night, I went to the uh, football match last night, and it wasn't the best result for the Faroe Islands. But I just think it's great that the Faroe Islands is competing in, the, in FIFA. I mean, 30 years ago, you didn't. We still remember the glorious 1-0 victory over Austria, which was, I think was fantastic. So, I mean, More or less beating Scotland. It's not about separate... Yeah. <laughs> Aye. We, we, OK, we were complacent in the first 20 minutes. The, 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 um, God, I've lost my trainer. We don't want to separate. We want to participate. We want Scotland, and I'm sure the Faroes and Catalonia are the same, want to be part of the world's institutions. We want to be... We work, we work with people share things. You know, we're not talking about isolation, we're talking about partnership. Uh, but, but with a partnership where we take the, the, the main decisions that affect our people. Kenneth Gibson, thank you very thank you. much. Give him applause. <laughs> now, ladies and gentlemen, to... Um, a uh, very exotic place in the world. It is more or less on the other side of the globe compared to the Faroe Islands. As far as I know, it's about 2,000 kilometers northeast uh, of uh, Australia. It's called New Caledonia. And it's very interesting that the guy who was on stage just before, he comes out of Scotland, and the name New Caledonia obviously means New Scotland originally. <laughs> So, we have just heard about old Scotland, now we're going to hear about the new one. And um, the representative uh, who has come out of uh, New Caledonia, the leader of the delegation, is Daniel Goa. I know that in a paper we have written that he is a president of New Caledonia, and that is not right. He is a president to be after independence. <laughs> but, but he is the leader of the independence movement in, um, in uh, New Caledonia. And he will be presenting together with Ilan Kilo. And the floor is yours. Please. <clears throat> Bonjour. Bonjour. Ta Bonjour. I am a teacher. I am a teacher. I am a teacher. I am a 
And I'm a time in a Korea and me in a pretty hind down. I'm a tongue around my gen enemy. In the old Manga, I Yelipalangaru Kiloe, O Cape, I wear an inam for Farangele, to palpal along. In the Holy Boy and Dad, no coin. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, the Prime Minister of Faroe Island, the Deputy Prime Minister the Speaker of Parliament, all members of Parliament that are present here today, the independent uh, leaders of Catalonia, uh, Scottish, and also uh, others that are present here today, ladies and gentlemen. For practical reasons, I stand here today uh, to present this statement on behalf of the Linda of Delegation, as well as uh, the president of the Kanaki Association for Liberation Movement. Uh, we also have, as part of the delegation, the permanent secretary of the uh, Kanaki Liberation Movement uh, that are here with us, as well as the president of the youth organization in New Caledonia. Uh, Mr. Dimitri Kennege. So, on behalf, I'm presenting uh, this statement, and I'll try to go really slowly so that we can follow the case in New Caledonia. First of all, I would like to express our most sincere appreciation uh, to Honorable Magna. IG, for the invitation extended to us to participate in this conference, as well as the courtesies and hospitalities that were extended to us uh, since our arrival here in your beautiful country. The question that we would like to address this afternoon is what role has the United Nations played in the implementation of the Numea Accord. And we will try to provide some elements of analysis and reflections of what we think are the reasons. And I have stated earlier on in my question and the remark, uh, the Numea Accord is an agreement that was signed um, between the Kanaki uh, liberation movement and the administrative power of France that sets out the process for the colonization of New Caledonia. To begin with, the United Nations with the adoption of the uh, General Assembly Resolution uh, 1514 of uh, 14 December 1960 on the declaration on the granting of independence to colonial countries and powers provided a clear framework under Article 1 and 2. The subjection of the people to foreign domination and the exploitation constitutes a denial of fundamental human rights is contrary to the Charter of United Nations and undermines the cause of world peace and cooperation. All peoples have the right to self-determination and by virtue of this right can freely determine their political status and freely pursue their economic, social and cultural development. In addition, the declaration of human rights and all global decisions would enshrine the right of colonized people uh, in this vision. For example, the United Nations International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, which have the same article in 1.1, 1 .1, for all peoples have the right to self-determination. 
Subsequently, the United Nations General Assembly adopted the establishment of the Special Committee on Decolonization, which is responsible for implementing the declaration with a series of technical and legal tools enabling to accompany the non-self-governing territories with an annual work plan and mandate. Kanaki, New Caledonia, the Melanesian land of the Pacific, was colonized, colonized by France for over 65 years ago to this day. The colonized Kanaki people experience all sorts of challenges, forms of colonial uh, repression, uh, exploitation, of resources, suppression of right uh, to speak their own language, right to education, and right to work until the end of Second World War when, like all colonized people of the world, they began to enter into a new political dynamics materialized by the right to vote that they had in 1953. Then we tried as best we could to put our people in a position of progress. The winds of freedom that blew across Melanesia in the Pacific in the 1970s and 1980s, following the independence of most of the countries in Melanesia, um, including Papua New Guinea, Fiji, Solomon Islands, and Vanuatu, gave a new impetus to the New Caledonian struggle. It was in this context that the struggle of influence began with France to get the Kanaki people to admit and to exercise the right to self-determination. This struggle culminated on 2nd December 1986 with the reinstatement of Kanaki New Caledonia on the United Nations list of decolonized territories for the decolonization process. Since then, the General Assembly has adopted an annual resolution on Kanaki New Caledonia to observe its political progress and to watch full and complete emancipation. 32 resolutions since 19, resolution 32 in 1986. The the Kanak Liberation Movement has signed two successive agreements with France and the pro-French parties. First, the, Magnet the Ma Matingon Agreement in 1988, the so-called Political and Economic Rebalancing Agreement, and the new mayor agreement in 1998. The process for emancipation and decolonization process with the Canucks at the center of the system and an irreversible transfer of competencies until obtaining full sovereignty. We are therefore coming to the end of this modern an innovative process of decolonization with the referendum that will be held just 23 days from now, on the 4th of November, 2018, that's next month, during which the population consent will have to answer to the question, which is, do you want New Caledonia to attain full sovereignty and become independent? So that's the question 
that will be answered on 4th of November. Nevertheless, the last 20 years have not been easy. The process for decolonization and total implementation of the political agreements that were signed with French, which perpetuated a system of exploitation of wealth which favors a growing social imbalance on the one hand and on the other hand to watch the administering power which has organized or facilitated, facilitated massive immigration aimed at making us a minority in our own country, thus allowing it to structure their influence. To fight against this dominance, we are able to rely on the support of our Pacific neighbors, and in particular, the Melanesian Spearhead Group. And at this juncture, I would like to uh, say a bit more about Melanesian Spearhead Group, what it constitutes and what it stands for. Uh, the Melanesian Spearhead Group is a, a sub-regional organization in the Pacific that consists of Melanesian countries, uh, namely Papua New Guinea, uh, Solomon Islands, my home country, Vanuatu, uh, Fiji, and the Kanak Liberation Movement always Papu uh, of, of New Caledonia. Um, Fiji obtained independence in 1970. Papua New Guinea uh, obtained their independence in 1975. Uh, Solomon Islands and their independence in 1978. And Vanuatu in 1980. So these are the sort of influence that led to the formation of the sub regional organization. And only one member, the Kanak Liberation Movement, that's still under a colonial <clears throat> administrative. And so the organization was formed basically to support the struggle uh, of Kanaki people to obtain uh, their independence. In 2013, the leaders of the MSG, in short, the Melanesian Spearhead Group, adopted a declaration in Numea that's called the Numea Declaration, reaffirming their support for the independent uh, movement in New Caledonia. And early this year, during the meeting in Port Mosby in Papua New Guinea, an action plan was adopted to further their support uh, for the independence movement in New Caledonia. And all the member countries of the MSG are also members of the United Nations, two of which are also members of the Spatial Decolonization Committee. So the strategies that we use to support the independence movement in New Caledonia is through the United Nations, through that framework that we've established, and through the influence of our ambassadors in New York. And so that's the connection, and uh, we also lobby internationally, regionally, and nationally to implement and to continue to support the struggle of uh, New Caledonia towards independence. And that's the main reason I'm here with the delegation to continue to advocate for this noble cause. It is in this context that since March 2014, we have been able to benefit from five United Nations movements, uh, missions to New Caledonia. Three missions 
by the Department of Political Affairs of the United Nations, Electoral Observation Missions, and two visiting missions of the Special Committee on Decolonization. The reports of these missions are primarily diplomatic in nature. Nevertheless, we note that the subject denounced by the Ethelene KS or the concerns raised by the Kanaki movement for liberation find a sincere place in the official decisions of the General Assembly. And in particular on these particular issues that have been raised. Firstly, on the electoral process, the UN noted there are certain breach of principles of equality in the treatment of waters. It also noted treatment of waters in similar cases that the right of appeal was ineffective. And it invited the administering power to review its methods of drawing up the electoral process, and in particular the electoral list. On natural resources, the United Nations reaffirmed that natural resources are the heritage of the people of the non-self-governing ter territory, including the Kanaki indigenous peoples. And in this context, the General Assembly urges the administering power to take appropriate measures to protect and guarantee the rights of the New Caledonian people over the natural resources. On immigration, the General Assembly noted the continuing concern of the Kanaki people about the underrepresentation in the government and social structures due to the continuing migration of people into New Caledonia. On the referendum process, the General Assembly noted that appropriate measures needs to be taken for the organization of the future consultation on full sovereignty, including the establishment of a fair, regular, credible, and transparent electoral list, as provided for in the Numea Accord, are essential for the achievement of a free, and fair act of self-determination in accordance with the charter and the principles and practices of the United Nations. Recently in March this year, the second visiting mission of the Special uh, Committee on Decolonization also noted that racial discrimination continues to be developed against the indigenous people of Kanaki. And so in short, we consider that the Kanak liberation movement has significant political leverage that will allow us to bounce back in the event if the outcome of the referendum next month tends out to be against against us. On the other hand, in the event, if the referendum outcome is in favor of the Kanaki people, we will propose the establishment of a two to four year plan, uh, a period for the establishment of the new state under the United Nations what's to enable us to establish the foundations of the new state. The proclamation of the new state will activate our exit from the list of the countries under the decolonization list. And before I conclude, I would like to tell you that while the recent opinion polls turns out to be against independence, we are hoping that the outcome could change and be in our favor. An accession of New Caledonia 
to independence would constitute a historic opportunity for our planet because it will make it possible to better respond to the global challenges facing our society today at the local, regional, and international level to ensure the advancement of peace, peaceful cooperation amongst nations. Ladies and gentlemen, with these few remarks, I'd like to again thank you for your attention. Thank you, Tomas. Thank you, Vinaka Vakalevu Oleti. Thank you very much for a very interesting presentation on, on the path to independence in New Caledonia and on the matters that mean so much to you in your home country. Uh, we have a question for you. Uh, I hope you will be ready to answer. And Björn Konoy, Joshua. I'll... Uh I'll start with English and uh, then uh, I may translate also to French. Uh, uh, I'll do it uh, myself, thank you. Um, the situation of New Caledonia is quite singular of comparisons made to uh, Catalonia or the Faroe Islands for that matter. You are a subject of international law because you are under the obligations that arise for France with regard to Chapter 11 under the United Nations Charter. Um, yet the normal rule would be that it is discretion for the state, the member state of the United Nations, to determine which subjects are entitled to fall within the realm of Chapter 11. Yet you managed, with significant endeavours, to engage the General Assembly of the United Nations to, uh, to adopt a resolution, notwithstanding the position on France on that particular question, but the result of which is that New Caledonia um, was a part of those subjects which fall under Chapter 11. And I would think it very interesting to hear more about that process, as it is, from an international legal point of view, a very interesting uh, uh, step. And secondly, uh, an, in an interesting matter also in this regard, with regard to the referendum which is being held on 4th November, is what are the criteria f uh, to participate in elections? Is it residence, or would one have to have resided in New Caledonia for X amount of years or months in order to be entitled to participate in elections? Je disais tout court que normalement la procédure c'est que c'est l'État membre de la, des Nations Unies qui a les droits discrétionnaires de décider quel territoire tombe sous le chapitre 11 de, de la charte de l'ONU. Et par contre, dans le cas de la Nouvelle-Calédonie, c'est effectivement des euh, États euh, de la région qui ont réussi euh, à faire en sorte que l'Assemblée générale a, a pris ordre de cette question et a adopté une résolution dont le résultat est que la Nouvelle-Calédonie tombe dans le chapitre 11 de la, de, de la charte de, de l'ONU. Nous obstons la position de la France sur cette petite question. Et ma deuxième question, c'était, ce sera bien intéressant de savoir quels sont les critères afin de participer dans les élections le 4 novembre. C'est un critère de résidence, faut-il avoir vécu sur le territoire de la Nouvelle-Calédonie pendant X euh, euh, mois ou, ou années Bien, merci d'avance de votre réponse. Thank you. Thank you very much for that uh, very good question. I think I'll try to answer the first part of the question, uh, and our Linda will answer the second part of the question. I think the my understanding on your question, the first part, through the framework of the United Nations, as you uh, rightly said that um, under the uh, United Nations Charter and the subsequent resolutions that um, confirmed the right for self-determination of people had in fact recognized 
uh, the process that uh, is happening in New Caledonia. And that for us is an advantage because we use that process uh, to advocate uh, for the right of self-determination. Uh, more importantly in that process, uh, the engagement that we have uh, with our missions at the United Nations have proved to be very essential and important. Uh, initially because of the influence that our members have and the connections and the networkings that we have at, at the United Nations and to be able to raise and raise concerns with regards to uh, the referendum process but as well as uh, uh, the process it's itself and the support of the um, 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 MSG, the Melanesian Spain Group. So it has been quite successful in terms of um, um, advancing and, and promoting the process at the international uh, level. In particular, uh, the uh, United Nations and, and the action plan that was adopted by our leaders this year, uh, that I have alluded into in my, in my, my statement, that recognizes and uh, recognizes that process for us to continue that support uh, at the in, uh, United Nations and to continue to provide um, an avenue where the liberation movement uh, and the Kanaki people can be able to raise their issues and concerns. So that process had been very useful uh, for the decolonization process uh, in, in New Caledonia. And during uh, sessions of this uh, Spatial Committee on Decolonization, uh, the, the territories under the decolonization list are also provided the opportunity to present petitions in those some committees. So that's another avenue that we use to be able to um, raise concerns and, and to be able to uh, promote uh, the decolonization process. And also to uh, lobby for support amongst the members of the United Nations. So it has been uh, quite successful. And uh, from our perspective, we will continue to use that avenue uh, to uh, further uh, promote and also provide assistance to the people of Kanaki in that process. The second question. I will answer the second question. You will translate it. So, concerning cette population qui va prendre part à la décision dans le référendum, euh, c'est que nous sommes dans une période de décolonisation. Nous avons mis 30 ans, 10 ans de l'accord de Matignon, 10 ans de l'accord de Nouméa, ça fait 30 ans pour sortir du géant français. Et en même temps, la France, elle finance la décolonisation. Ça veut dire que beaucoup d'argent français sont arrivés. Et donc, il y a l'activité économique qui a monté en ampleur. Et donc, ça a attiré plein d'immigration. Beaucoup de gens sont arrivés parce qu'il faut travailler. Nous, nous ne sommes qu'à 300 000 habitants. Et après 165 ans de vie avec la France, on n'a toujours pas de médecin, on n'a toujours pas d'avocat, on n'a pas de juge. Et je ne parle pas du niveau scolaire en milieu kanak, en milieu océanien. Ça veut dire que la France n'a rien fait pour préparer le pays à sortir. Par contre, quand il y a du développement économique qui appelle les gens à venir pour occuper les postes, eh bien, jusqu'à présent, ces gens-là ont le droit de faire le choix sur notre avenir. Ça veut dire qu'ils votent. Ils votent. Alors, celui qui arrive hier par l'avion, ben, il ne connaît pas le pays, il ne connaît pas les gens, il ne connaît même pas la situation politique du pays, ben, il vote. Il va voter pour qui Pour la France. Donc contre nous, ils subissons la politique de la France là-bas. Et donc, euh, 
avec l'accord de Noumé, on a dit, bon, il va falloir commencer à, à, à construire le peuple calédonien. Le peuple kanak, plus le peuple du Vietnam, de Wallis, de Tahiti, le peuple de France, il y a une partie du peuple de France qui est admis là-bas parce que, vu son histoire, sa présence sur le pays, il a, il a, il a construit le pays avec nous. Et donc, nous avons euh, choisi, euh, selon les critères qu'on avait déterminés, de mettre en place une population qui va devenir la citoyenneté calédonienne demain. C'est cette population-là, 164 000 personnes, 174 000 personnes, qui sont les citoyens du pays. Donc, c'est eux qui vont voter au référendum. Et tous les autres qui arrivent, ben, ils sont là parce qu'ils n'ont ils pas à choisir la destinée du pays. Par contre, les communes, les mairies, ils sont restés euh, des mairies françaises. Donc, euh, eux, ils peuvent voter dans les mairies pour élire les maires, pour le conseil municipal. Mais le Parlement, qu'on appelle le Congrès, comme les provinces, c'est l'organisation du pays qui a été fixé par l'accord de Nouméa, qui a 20 ans aujourd'hui. Eh bien, ça, ça concerne les Calédoniens. Donc, ils vont devenir les citoyens calédoniens qui ont un pays et un droit de vote. Et voilà, je ne sais pas si j'ai... <rire> I fully understand that he would like to uh, explain all things to us, but there are so many of us who don't understand the French answer. So, um, uh, who can elaborate very shortly on the answers? Kaduja? Yeah, so, I say that it will be a 30th of June, and that we have been sitting from Matignon, from the Jotfors, and then we have been out of the from the Jotfors. Och sen det du som var upplyst så Frakland investerar i några pengar i Nomia, i Nya Kaledonia och nu växer en del Fräklandiga i flottet i Nya Kaledonia och som sagt att de kunde orka utsluta, vi ser sig kunde inte låta i fattiga kvinnor. Och vi ser nu att det är uppbyggningen av olja landstöje med en folk som är upprunnade i Hena. Och det är så vi ser att för några år sedan är det just en en konstruktion som är till en uppbygg i Nya Kaledonia, men då kan inte han Ukraina inte kvätta in i bär och kriterier skulle uppfyllt för för en uppbygg. Men ändå måste vi vi här som är för att fira att folk ska komma nu i flotten Nya Kaledonia nu är det inte och inte har några tillhörare till stäga kunde jag låta i att komma. Thank you very much, Daniel Goa, and the representatives of New Caledonia. Should we give them a big applause? Merci. And we wish you the best of luck in the future. We have reached to a point where there is a break on the agenda. 20 minutes break and at 15.20... Carlos Pistemont will announce how to pronounce his name. <laughs> <laughs> There is something they call a keynote speaker, and that is the main speaker of a conference. And whether he has been addressed as a keynote speaker or not, the next speaker would anyway be the one who would draw most attention. I first met him... <laughs> I think a year ago in 13 days or something like that when I went to Catalonia to watch and observe how the election process went forward with the, uh, with the referendum on the right to vote for, um, uh, uh, for self-determination. And um, we all know how things went on that 1st of October. And we also know what has happened ever since that. You can see here on a poster over here that there are nine of the leaders of uh, the Catalan independence movement are in jail in Spain and they, do, uh, they have not been in the court yet and tried their case. Some of them are facing threats of being jailed for 30 years. And on the other picture, on the lower part of it, is a picture of seven of the Catalan leaders who are actually today living in exile. One of them being Carles Puigdemont, who's going to address you now, and uh, 
I think that uh, we will offer you the floor, and maybe you will start by presenting yourself. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> just say that in Catalonia they still call him President Carlos Puigdemont. Thank you very much. Thank you, Magni. First of all, let me say a big, big thank you to all of you for your invitation to be present here for your questions, I suppose. Um, dear Kenneth, uh, I succeed to bring the weather that I come from, because I come from Belgium now. <laughs> so uh, that seems quite uh, Belgium weather, not, of course, a Catalan weather. But I, I will try to explain what's exactly the situation now today in Catalonia. But let me say before that, to, to have an um, explanation about uh, what we've gone one year ago. The self-determination referendum on the 1st of October uh, 2017 and the subsequent political declaration of independence voted by the Parliament of Catalonia on the 27th of the same month were the culmination of the first phase of the so-called Catalan process. Catalonia decided to become an independent state but the democratic implementation of the new republic was prevented by the force and physical violence of the Spanish state. You can see some of the, a lot of videos explaining, showing the kind of uh, violence the Spanish state has used against uh, peaceful citizens. After more than seven years, the pro-independence movement in Catalonia has been demonstrating massively in a peaceful way all over the streets of our nation and has filled now and again the ballot boxes with votes for the full sovereignty of Catalonia. Every year, our national day in the 11th of September has shown millions of people mobilized in favor of independence breaking the news all over the world with its remarkably peaceful character. With people of all age, these mobilizations have been the biggest in Europe since the fall of communism and Berlin's Wall. Thus, there is a high-stakes political conflict between Catalonia and the Spanish state. A conflict that the Catalan society, society wants to solve respecting two principles. First, there must be political dialogue over how can Catalonia exercise this sovereignty. And secondly, the decision must be agreed by the Catalan people through a referendum. In most democratic countries, this kind of situation will have led to a political agreement. But that not, that's not the case in Spain. Instead of public recognition, today the leaders who organized those demonstrations with no incidents have been imprisoned, accused of sedition, a charge for which you can receive from 15 to 30 years of prison. Jordi Sanchez and Jordi Cuchart are in preventive jail without having been condemned, treated like terrorists in violation of their fundamental rights to freedom. Next week, we will celebrate one year in preventive jail. One year. I am myself today, together with all my government colleagues that helped me to organize the 1st of October referendum, accused of rebellion and risking 30 years of prison. Six of them are still in preventive prison, as well as the president of Catalan Parliament, Carme Furcadell, 
And the seven of us continue to be in exile in Scotland, in Switzerland, or in Belgium, as myself. Meanwhile, freedom of expression, freedom of information, and freedom of assembly have been cartilage, and the authoritarian derive of Spain has been, has been recognized as a European concern. Despite of, uh, all of that, I insist that the only way to solve peacefully this conflict is dialogue. To start a negotiation with no red lines and in a climate, climate of respect for both sides. I would like to see Prime Minister Pedro Sánchez, Spanish Prime Minister, doing the same thing. It is sad to see how he rejects once and again to talk about the right of self-determination of Catalonia. I don't know if he realizes that he will, be, will not be able to defend for much longer the old order in Spain. The Catalan people cannot be tied to a state against their own will in the 21st century. It is said to see also that the Spanish Prime Minister has not taken steps to finish with repression. His general prosecutor, nominated by the Spanish government, still has the change to Europeanize the standards of a Spanish justice and understand that organizing a referendum cannot and should not be labeled as a rebellion or a crime of sedition. Treating a vote as an act of war seems to me the kind of things that a dictatorship will do, not a consolidated Western democracy. Prime Minister Sanchez should be aware that while there is instability and repression in Catalonia, it will be very difficult to, for Spain to remain politically stable. There are many reforms to do to be ready for the next economic crisis, for example. And political capital is limited. It is my advice to Prime Minister Sanchez to talk with Catalan government about a political solution and about self-determination as soon as possible. Moreover, it must be understood that political persecution has caused a real trauma in Catalan society. Perhaps you will think that in the world higher levels of violence are not to be seen in the other states. And you are absolutely right from that point of view. However, from a relative point of view, the state's anger against Catalan citizens has been extremely high. We are a modern te technological society open to the world that could never have suspected that this level of violence will be exerted, living in an Europe whose foundational values, foundational values are freedom and democracy. Can you imagine that this will have take, taken place in Scotland or in Quebec or in the Faroese Island? The Spanish state must leave aside anger and rage as many Catalans want their own state and the unity of Spain cannot be a religious principle. It's not a matter of faith, it's a matter of democracy. We want to sit down to negotiate a referendum on self-determination that is binding and internationally recognized. I have always said that uh, it is worthwhile to do it again. If this, time, if this time the other party, the one with the power of the force, Spain, accepts to participate in it and to recognize it. But otherwise, we will feel committed to the mandate of October, of the October referendum, to implement the Catalan Republic without delay. 
We only want what has already been done re repeatedly in other cases, like Scotland and Quebec. Also in November 4th, France, as my colleague has explained before, in New Caledonia, organized a referendum, France organized a referendum of self-determination in New Caledonia, although of, for many French people that territory is an integral part of France. As a Catalan, I would like to be in another situation. Here, in the Faroe Islands, you are on the right direction. The right direction to reach a deal with Denmark for a new constitution that will respect, hopefully, your right to, to self-determination. Scotland made a deal with London to have an independent referendum, for independence referendum. And who knows if soon we will have a second one. And even Jacobin and centralist France has negotiated an independence referendum with New Caledonia. But at the same time, I'm happy and proud. Europe, Europe, not Europe institutions, but European society, is moving step by step, little, little by little, but surely. Today, we, the small nations of Europe, are the forces of positive change in Europe. In the midst of a wave of authoritarian politics, we defend our right to self-determination, our right to democracy, our right to give our people a say over its own future. We shall continue, because with our efforts, we are building a better and a stronger Europe and a favored world. In order to succeed, a globalized world needs to be based on a true, true sense of diversity, able to respect its minorities, to give them political power to decide their own future, to be able to define their own strategies for the future. To find their own concrete solutions for the global problems that we all need to confront. When I look to, into Scotland or into, into New Caledonia or into the New Faroe Island, I don't know, I don't see a problem but a receipt for our common future, for a world common future. However, it's not only us who can, who can make change possible. We need partners. Therefore, it is fundamental that Denmark, France and the United Kingdom have understood that by allowing our peoples to vote, they are deepening the strength of their democracy. There is no stronger border than the one that has been ratified in the ballot boxes. Spain needs to set aside its obsession with sacred unity and leave Catalonia become an independent and friendly neighboring state. Of course, we have some difficulties today in Catalonia. And maintaining political unity is not the least of them. Repression has effects and makes the worst fears from all of us to arise. This is what we need to fight against. We need to remember that our adversary are those that use violence against ballot boxes, those that put in prison our colleagues and friends, those that legitimize, leg legitimize the repression instead of denouncing it. Our adversary can never be those that defend self-determination or independence in a different way from ourselves or those that want to vote against independence because it's his right. In our internal diversity, we need to find our strength 
not our weakest point. I have friends in prison. I have friends in exile. Party and government colleagues, I wish they were not there, and I wish they will be immediately released. I wish they could return home tomorrow. I understand they sacrifice, and I'm grateful to them. Catalonia is the only country I know in the European Union where so many politicians are ready to pay the price for their ideas and convictions. We need to be proud about it and to keep, and to keep up our peaceful right for independence and self-determination. The current structure of the Spanish state, 40 years after the approval of the uh, Spanish constitution, after the Franco's death, 40 years ago, the structure of the Spanish state is not able to manage the challenges we are in the frame of the fourth industrial revolution. It doesn't matter if the prime minister is Pedro Sánchez from the Socialist Party or Mariano Rajoy from the Popular Party. It doesn't matter. The problem lies much deeper than that. The day that uh, this is understood outside and inside Spain, it will be easier to work towards a permanent solution. Be ready, because my colleagues in prison risk to be condemned to many years in prison for crimes that never were never committed. And the Catalan people will not accept it. I expect, and I wish, that there will be a massive non-violent mobilization in defense of our rights and in support of our colleagues in jail. Many people still skeptic with independence are Democrats that cannot accept that innocent people remain so long in prison or exile. I believe in them as I believe in the more than two million of pro-independent citizens that have resisted the pressure to give up. There will be ups and there will be downs, but is in the democratic dignity of our people that will find the seat for a better future. Always peaceful, always non-violent, but with a clear goal in our minds and hearts, self-determination, and if this is the will of the people, establishing the new Catalan Republic. Thank you very much, Magni. Thank you very much for all of you and for your questions too. And thank you very much for your attention. I would like to, well, we now have a possibility to ask uh, questions to Puigdemont, and um, I will uh, start with one question here, uh, once you got some water. <laughs> and that is uh, about the um, people who are jailed in Spain. Mm -hmm. With this new government of Sanchez, what are the outlook for that you will have a more civilized uh, behavior from the state versus these people? I mean, will there, when, when will there be a fair trial, and what will the no. charges be, and what, what is your expectations? Well, uh, we decide to, to go to exile in order to defend our rights to have a fair trial, because that is not possible in Spain. For many reasons, for many reasons. First of all, because the, there is no separation, a clear separation of powers in Spain. The General Council of the Judiciary, Judiciary Power, the members of the Supreme Court, and the members of the uh, Audiencia Nacional are nominated by the political majority. And the political majority always, since the first democratic elections, was in the hands of the Populist Party or in the Socialist Party, who are clearly, clearly against our right to self-determination. So, 
There is no guarantees. There's a lot of mistakes in that procedure. We will denounce that in the European uh, Court of Human Rights. Um, and I'm afraid we, when the trial start, I suggest to you to follow the, the trial because you will discover how uh, Spain managed uh, the, the, the right to have a, a fair trial. Mm. The policy, we, when we decide to support the new prime minister, because he has become, he has elected with our votes in the Spanish parliament, for example, uh, we uh, expected the prime minister Pedro Sánchez will explain a new receipt for our crisis. We don't expect to see a kind of 2.0 version of the Rajoy's receipt because it doesn't work. But after several months in power, uh, Pedro Sánchez has shown its incapacity, incapacity to explain if, they ha if he has or not a project for Catalonia. And the time has finished. And probably the next week we will see how Pedro Sánchez lose its parliamentary support because it's time to have an answer. Are you, Mr. Sánchez, in the same path as Mr. Mr. Romero Rajoy, or are you trying to, to start a new deal with Catalonia in order to recognize that is a real problem? Trying to solve political problem through the general prosecutor, through prisons, the penal court, is to do a very huge mistake because it's a political and constitutional matter. It's not a crime to call for a referendum. It's not a crime to ask people uh, its opinion, its will, uh, their will for uh, its future. So if the general prosecutor insists to accuse my colleagues and myself as rebels, uh, so that means that a viol violent people who use guns and weapons in order to impose uh, as a, change, uh, a political change, that is the, the worst way to solve that uh, political crisis and a threat that could uh, increase the tensions between Catalonia and Spain. Following up on that, uh, following up on that uh, question, there was a discussion uh, when this happened that Rajoy was a kind of covering up for his own internal political problems, and the Catalans were a sort of a minority in the Spanish kingdom, and he had an advantage uh, with gathering more votes behind him by being very uh, harsh towards the Catalonian. Is it the same with Sanchez? We'll see, because Sanchez is a minority, a clear minority, and uh, we don't know when we will call for uh, elections. Normally, the general elections, the legislative elections in Spain, um, will be uh, held in, in 2020, but uh, I can't remember exactly the month. Uh, we'll see. Eh? Uh, but that is a fact. We are a minority. Catalans are only 16% of the Spanish population. That is one problem because we have no any kind of possibility to exercise a political pressure in order to promote a constitutional change. It's impossible. When, for example, several years ago, we approved in the Catalan parliament with a huge majority including non-pro-independence party, a proposition to the Spanish parliament to allow Catalan government to call for a non-binding consultation, which is in the frame of the Spanish constitution, the majority of Spanish parties voted against that. So there is no one single possibility in the frame of the Spanish constitution to call for a non-binding consultation to the Catalan people about its future. Why? Because, yes, you are right. Uh, that kind of attitude against Catalonia has a result, has a, a, a electoral result. But it's time to change that strategy, that narrative. Uh, it's not possible to, uh, to have a political stability in Spain without Catalonia. 
without a dialogue in Catalonia. And that is clear if you look the last years. And uh, probably after the elections, we will see the same. Because despite we are a minority, we want to do politics and we want to continue fighting for our rights. And that's, that has effects in the reality of Spain, despite the opinion of the, the main parties. We, yes, we are the minority, but we are the most powerful economical region in Spain. We represent more than 25.5 the Spanish exports. And we receive a third of the in direct uh, uh, foreign investments in Spain. So we are a very poor, powerful reality. So it's, it's, it's well, it's, uh, intelligent to have a good relationship with uh, such a uh, powerful uh, region. Not threaten, not put its leaders in jail, not uh, follow the... There are actually 700 mayors in Catalonia, 700 mayors in Catalonia prosecuted only for its approval, because they have approved in their community a resolution supporting the 1st of October referendum. And now it's a crime. Yesterday, the Catalan parliament approved a resolution presented by the left party, which are not for independence, the left party called Catalonia en Comú, and we approved a resolution against monarchy. And yesterday, in the afternoon, on the evening, Prime Minister Spanish Prime Minister has said that is not uh, acceptable and we will uh, de present a demand in the justice against that approval. A political approval saying we, we want to live in the Republic. Where is a crime in that approval? In um, this uh, process that you've been through now, both with the uh, political prisoners but also through your referendum, uh, we had a feeling that you were resting much upon the tradition of democracies in Western Europe and that the European Union would come to some sort of an assistance to respect the democratic rights and the human rights. Um, but you must have been some sort of um, unhappy about the response that you received so far. Can you rest upon yeah. that support in the future? Well, I, I'm, I must be precise. Uh, I'm disappointing, I mean, disappointed uh, by the European Union institution's attitude, not concerning our fighting for independence, because, of course, we expect no one single support from the states at the beginning. It was in the European tradition to say we are in the sight of the Spanish state, or etc. Not about that. I was very disappointed because regarding, I don't know if you can show uh, the videos, what you see uh, in the beginning of the presentation, uh, in face of such violation of fundamental rights, when a police from a, a, stat, a state member use violence against peaceful citizens, um, seeing that attitude, they have decided to remain silent. And that, that not concerns Catalans, that concerns European citizens as a whole. Because when uh, freedom or fundamental rights, human rights, European values are threatened in a part of the Union, that concerns the whole Union. Look at the case of Poland, Hungary, Italy. I am, uh, as, a, as a European citizen, I'm worried about the, the lack of commitment to fundamental rights in the, in the rest of Europe. Because if we accept there is, for example, in Poland, no separation of powers, that affects, of course, the Spanish attitude regarding the justice. So this silence is not acceptable. Because we are European citizens. And we show the best face of Europe protecting Ballot boxes, peaceful people from the old age go to votation despite the, all the threats, despite the violence, 
they go to the vote, the polling stations, and that is the best face of Europe, and the other was the worst face of Europe. So I don't, we don't expect uh, support for our struggle for independence. We, we expected at that moment a support as European citizens who were hit by a, pol a police from one uh, member of the European Union. That is my disappointment. Thank you. Um, I just want to ask you, uh, how do you get out of this deadlock? I mean, in your lecture, you, you talked about uh, you want uh, a dialogue with the Spanish authorities, and, uh, and there are no red lines, you say, but at the same time, you also refer a lot to, uh, to your goal of uh, gaining independence and uh, establishing a republic. So, so, I mean, what, what can one expect in a future dialogue? Could one expect maybe that you uh, settle with a, a revised autonomy statute, for example, uh, in line with uh, the proposal that was overturned by the uh, Constitutional Court in 2010, for example? Could one expect things like that? Or are you very, or are you very firm on independence? That's my question. Well, uh, in a dialogue, in the negotiation, uh, we, we must have the right to expose your project. So I, my, our project is a republic. It's an independent republic. Is that the only project possible for Catalonia? Of course not. <laughs> we try, for example, since uh, 1978, after the approval of the Spanish Constitution, we try to find our, our role in the frame of the Spanish uh, state. So we show, we, we showed there was different ways, despite the independent way, uh, to have a good relationship in Spain. But it's our project now to have a republic. So we expect to, to start a dialogue with the Spanish state uh, knowing what is exactly its project. Because there is no one other project on the table. So it's time to know if Spain has a Spanish project for Catalonia. Uh, the time is uh, finished. So, uh, Mr. Sanchez, or Spanish parliament, or a Spanish political system, are you some idea how to solve, uh, in addition of the violence and repression, uh, the political problem, or not? Because if not, we will continue. To impl to, for implementation of the Republic. So that means not red lines. Uh, we accept that the Spanish uh, government goes to negotiation saying, I want to propose to you a new Statute of Autonomy. It's, it's right. But we'll see that uh, exactly means because, as you remember, uh, uh, after the approval of the Constitution, the Constitution, the Spanish Constitution was in the beginning very open to the change. Because they say in the Article 2, the Spain is mm, mm, formed by regions and a new word called nationalities. A kind of synonym of nations. You are not exactly a nation, but of course you are not a region. So in that new concept, I, I think the, 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 the legislators at that time has imagined the next generations could decline uh, what that means in a more open point of view that they have in that moment, because we must not forget at that moment the army was watching all the democratic process and the army was very, very close to the Franco era. So, but the problem was in the, the sentence in 2010, the Spanish Constitutional Court has broken that agreement, has put a line a line, a end, an end, the levels and the limits, and the potential of the Spanish Constitution. And that is the problem because any kind of proposal from the Spanish government must be inside that limit. And it's a very low limit for us. So uh, for, I, I, I remember a, a, a score, a, a cathedratic of, on a constitutional law from the Civilian University, so it's not pro independent of Catalonia, it's not Catalan 
who at that time has written an article in the Opais newspaper calling that sentence as a coup d'etat. Because that's, that has finished the uh, constitutional agreement in 1978. Björn Konoy, Jojo. Thank you, Magna. If one looks at the events uh, immediately prior to the uh, elections on 1st October 2017, it appears obvious that the authorities in Madrid were not in agreement on the legality of the holding, the preparation of this referendum, this plebiscit on independence of Catalan. Um, if we look at this from an international legal point of view, uh, I would think that the most scholars and the international case law supports the understanding that there are only two situations in which a people has right to exercise external self-determination. One is the case of non self governing territories, which we have spoken about, uh, well, you have spoken, others have spoken about earlier today. And the second case is the so-called remedial self-determination, which uh, there is a military occupation or where blatantly the expression of the internal uh, self-determination is prevented by the uh, central authorities. Now, given the uh, position of Madrid, uh, I wonder it would be very enlightening to hear the position of, of, of yourself. Uh, how did you perceive this question prior to the organization of the elections? Were you of the view that you were entitled to express, to exercise an external self-determination? Or was this the fulfillment of an internal self-determination, which though may result yep. in uh, independence? Well, you, you must know that in the uh, Article 96 of the Spanish Constitution, they say clearly all the international treaties and covenants signed or ratified, sorry, by the Kingdom of Spain uh, will be part of the internal order of Spain. In 77, the Kingdom of Spain has ratified the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which first article first, uh, you has. Uh, so, uh, you have shown before. Eh? All peoples are right to self-determination. And Article 10 of the Spanish Constitution say, in case when rights recognized in that Constitution are in collision, will prevail the interpretation from the international point of view. So if you look at the, Spani the current uh, Spanish Constitution, the right of self-determination is recognized, but is not respected. That is important for us. Secondly, after the uh, Kosovo resolution, uh, it's clear there is no one single uh, point in the international law against the unilateral declaration of independence. That is clear. And finally, when we are a minority, with no <coughs> political capacity to change the things, we are tried all things. First, a new statute of autonomy, approved by the Catalan parliament with a huge majority. Uh, from 135 members, 120 voted yes. So it is clear, clear and a huge majority. We approved a new text. More than two thirds of the Spanish parliament approved it. And finally we approved by a referendum. We tried that, we failed because the constitutional court suspended. Then we demand a fiscal agreement, a new a new deal uh, concerning uh, our um, fiscal relationship with Spain in the line in exactly in the way that uh, Basque country has. We fail, we receive another no. After that, we demand to call for a non-binding consultation and we receive a no. After that, we proposed twice, uh, myself in front of Spanish Prime Minister, to collaborate to organize a referendum, like in the case of the United Kingdom. I was disposed to talk about, to discuss about the date, when, the question, it's only independence yes or not, or you can also propose a new deal, a new statute of autonomy. What kind of majority we need in order to apply the results? And finally, if we want, if we are agreed to resolve for a generation, despite the results, and we receive a no. So, what alternative we have, only a remedial secession, finally. Because uh, is, is the, self of, uh, the right of self-determination, for me, is a right, is a tool of peace. And is something contradictory to see uh, how the world only respect that right after a war. And the people who have killed themselves 
with a violent conflict, well, they are apprised to recognize its right of self-determination. That is a huge mistake. Because why about, what about the people like Nova Caledonia, or Scotland, or Quebec, or Flanders, or Ferrer, who try to exercise the right of self-determination only with non-violent means? By violent, non-violent means. So uh, we must be fighting about how we improve and modernize the right of self-determination. I think the next uh, question comes from uh, Rick, uh, oh, here, Jakob. Okay. Jack Van. Jack Van. Oh, sugar, Jakob. Uh, I have a question about uh, what, what's the philosophy of these Spanish authorities? Is the, the Spanish con constitution says that Spain is indivisible, but is, is the constitution supposed to be eternal? Is it unchanging forever? Is, is there no possibility of doing anything to, to change it sometimes in the future? And if you want, if you actually want to talk about changing the Spanish constitution, will you be thrown in jail? Will you be beaten? Will you never see the light of day again? So for, for that reason, I mean so the, the remedial secession. Because, it's, uh, well, you are right, the, the Article 2 of the Spanish Constitution, the first half say Spain is a uh, unity and divisible nation, but continues saying Spain is formed by regional nationalities too. And if we look the, 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 the literature of the uh, uh, right of self-determination, uh, they always are uh, uh, talking about people. We, Catalonia, as recognized as a people in our Statute of Autonomy, if you look at the Spanish Constitution, they talk about the peoples of Spain. We are people. So we are a political subject. And we are a right to exercise our right of self-determination. Um, in case of contradiction, I think uh, the right of self-determination is the tool to solve that such contradiction. Because it's not against the right uh, to unity uh, recognize it too by the, the chart of European United Nations. The, the, sorry, the, the integrity, the te territorial integrity, because that, uh, that right is uh, mm, it's, uh, only in case of uh, attack or invasion uh, from one country against another country, not concerns uh, in case of the internal uh, self determination. Look at the case of the Germany. The Germany has exercised a kind of self-determination right uh, when he unified. And, and uh, by the way, uh, that has not created one single problem for European Union. There was no problem to join European Union in case of the internal enlargement. Um, is the Spanish constitution the problem? No. Really no. There are several uh, experts, not for independence of Catalonia, who are saying that the Catalans want to know, that means if there is or not a clear majority for independence, that is perfect uh, in the frame of the Spanish constitution. The problem is the political will. And we will never have the possibility to change that political will. Be because the idea of unity of Spain is above democracy. It concerns a mystical idea. You can discuss mm, a lot of subjects with the Spanish politicians, but when, once you start to discussing about the unity of Spain, there is a, a, a absolutely mm, problem. That in, they, they are not able to discuss normally about that because it seems uh, an idea that comes from God. And that is about democracy, human rights. It's incredible, but uh, that the problem is that the idea of unity of Spain is something sacred. And we are fighting about that, because also the idea of Catalonia is absolutely not sacred. We can discuss about all the states. Mm -mm. So the problem is that it's a cultural problem. Um, when once uh, when I uh, I don't know if it was my last uh, uh, conference in Madrid uh, with the questions open to the the, the public, one uh, people asked me, one person asked me, uh, well, why why not uh, vote 
or whole Spain for independence of Catalonia? Yes, okay, why? Are you proposing uh, that Catalonia has the right to be independent and the, di the only difference between you and me is if it's a matter of vote for the whole of Spain or only Catalan people? And they say, well, no, no, no exactly for independence. Oh, wait. When I find uh, people who say, who say, you are not enough, okay, what's enough for you? It's uh, in case, the case of Montenegro, for example, 55? Okay, uh, no, no, well, uh, no, it's not exactly the majority, who will vote, the demos. It's the right in itself. Because finally we discover you, Catalan, you have not the right to decide your own future. And that's the problem. Because if not, we will find a solution, sure. Jacques Olason. Yeah. A journalist from the Fairways Radio. Uh, you partly just answered my question. You said it was a cultural issue, but I was uh, wondering if you could elaborate on that. Why is Spain different from, I don't know, Britain uh, or Denmark uh, or, or France, uh, for that sake, or Germany, as you, said, you, you mentioned yourself? <laughs> Uh, could you? Uh, this is probably a long story, maybe, but you could it's very long maybe story, yeah. shorten it a little bit. What are the cultural or historical contexts yes. that uh, uh, make Spain uh, react in a violent way? And question number two: um, Did you, before you uh, uh, started this process, did you expect Spain, the Spanish state, to uh, react in that way? So, were you conscious of the fact that this, this might actually be the result that you? Uh, would have a violent reaction and you would end up in exile yourself. Thank you. Thank you very much for your question. Well, um, I'm not an, uh, an expert in history, but I will try to, to answer uh, shortly your question, your first question. In fact, the big change in the uh, Iberian or Spanish monarchy was uh, in the beginning of the 18th century, uh, when uh, the, the after the war uh, of succession, uh, enter uh, the Bourbon dynasty from France. T till that time, uh, the kings were come from the Austro-Hungarian uh, dynasty, more confederate. More confederate. And uh, by the way, the, the name of the king, the first king, was Felipe II, Felipe the Fifth, and now we are under the Felipe the Sixth. So Felipe the Fifth. Uh, has uh, uh, approved a new plant decree and abolished, uh, banned the Catalan language, the Catalan institution, Catalan constitution, and start a very centralized, like in the French model, administration uh, that still are uh, in service, in fact. So what is one of the problems? The construction of uh, the centralized, centralized monarchy and the centralized state. And we, Catalonia, we we uh, defend the other candidate to the crown and we lose and we receive the consequences of our defeat. So uh, we uh, must wait till 1931 in the second Spanish Republic to restore our parliament, our government, our uh, right to self-government. And for a short time, because as you know, in 1939, Stars the, 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 the Franco's dictatorship, who has again banned Catalan language, Catalan institutions, etc., etc., and executed my predecessor, the, the former Catalan president, who also was in exile in France, was uh, extradited by the Germans at that time to the Spanish regime and was executed in 1940 in Barcelona. So uh, uh, I think uh, it was, uh, it was a, as you know, a big empire and to, to, to be a big empire to need that to, to be strong in the use of, of a military power. So I think that, that is one of the origins of our uh, crash of uh, attitudes uh, concerning how to manage the, the rights, the, the fundamental rights. The second question, uh, we ask, you asked me about if I expect that kind of reaction. Well, in fact, n not as we have seen. Because we believe, uh, I believe, and we generally believe, after 40 years of democracy, uh, to be part of the European Union, to use the European rule of law, and to protect, rhetorically, 
the human rights, there is a, a new ge political generation in Spain who, despite its opposition to, to an independent Catalonia, which is perfectly democratic, uh, despite that, they will accept to solve a problem through uh, the dialogue. And we were wrong, because there has no one single problem to use violence in front of uh, international media. No one single problem. Why, when, when CNN, Al Jazeera are broadcasting uh, when uh, uh, I must go to vote, they start to hit the people. And we, of course, in that sense, we didn't expect that kind of reaction. We expect uh, a reaction as till the 1st of October till, uh, from ten, the 1st of October till 10th of October, uh, I received in a kind of, no, not exactly back channel, but in our uh, relationship with the Spanish government. They say, okay, I understand uh, the 1st of October, change the things, we must talk, uh, it's possible to allow a window of dialogue. Um, we, you has won, but you were not enough, etc., etc., etc. We start that. Uh, that was a joke because they, they uh, has after, one week after our first declaration of independence, they had the start of a huge uh, re repression, and the Jordis were uh, put in jail. Are we going to give this man an applause? Yeah. Thank you. Can it? Can it? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is, this is the um, final session and, um, and uh, we are about to uh, round up this um, event. But uh, Mr. Puigdemont, there was one question you didn't answer. Uh, Barça. How do you pronounce your name? Ah, uh, okay. Uh, Puigdemont. Puigdemont. Excuse me. <laughs> Das verhöckne, das verhöckne. It means the right of the people. I can find a very wrong so did it fire him here some microphone now or fire it here? Yes, sorry. Well, we will have um, two short questions here in the end before we are rounding up. And uh, one of the questions is where we actually started. I mean, we've been through this uh, evolution of uh, the right to self-determination over the last hundred years, and we have seen a change in attitude and how the arguments are going forwards and backwards. What can we do to modernize this idea of the self-determination in the 21st century to support nations like those that you are representing? Artists? Well, I have an idea. Uh, forget the glasses to look, the glasses from the 20th century and change for the new glasses to look for the 21st century. Because nothing that has able or um, to, yeah, able to manage the challenges from the 20th centuries is uh, useful or is, uh, help us, uh, or is able to help us to solve the new challenges. Nothing to do with colonialism in general, nothing to do with against, fighting against dictatorship or wars. It concerns democracy, fundamental rights, and, and the new empowerment of the citizens. We are, we are in, under the effects of the fourth industrial revolution and the new uh, digital revolution that put in your hands more power than the has Mm, society in the whole humanity. With that single tool, you have more power than 50 years ago if you have a gun. That is more powerful. And that is in your hand. It's quite, uh, it's unbelievable. The governments in the 21st century don't use that in order to improve our society, in order to achieve our challenges fighting against the climate change, to protect human rights, etc. And that 
uh, is very uh, linked in the basis on how we must look today to the right of self-determination. Well, I fully agree with Carlos. Um, it's about the concept of, uh, of democracy uh, and the way forward. And you mentioned, Martin, a fourth step or a fourth period in, in, the, in, the, in the history of mankind regarding human rights, regarding, regarding um, nations' rights and so on. So I fully agree that we have to work together also in, in all international forums. Uh, to exercise um, the rights to democracy and to decide for ourselves, um, also with the diversity of nations. Uh, because I still believe that the glasses, uh, Carlos mentioned, the glasses of the old nation states, um, we often hear this that when, when, when you struggle for independence, you are nationalists in, in a <laughs> negative sense. But actually, I believe that the, that the, the biggest obstacle for a democratic and prosperous world is the nationalism of the old nation states. Yeah. Preventing uh, rights to peoples which they self claim is the basis of their ideals and so on. And we have seen that now in Europe. And I must, of course, claim that I'm, I'm also shocked and upheld by what I see uh, in, the, in, in Spain and also the reaction from Europe. Um, because even though European states will not support Catalonian independence, that they don't, do not protest against the, the violence and the violation and the imprisonment of, of, of uh, democratic people, that's, that's quite, quite a shock. And we, of course, support you in that. And I believe still, it's, it's still the question of the, old, of the power of the old nation states, because um, even though there are, it's not similar what, in all our countries what, what has happened, but we also saw in the Faroe Islands that the, this question of using legality or legal power to oppress political process we have seen. Our referendum in 1946 was not acknowledged because it was pro-independence, but I'm sure it, has been, it had been acknowledged if it was uh, against independence. And I believe so also, that if the referendum in Catalonia would have been against independence, then the European institutions would say, well, now we protest <laughs> against these, uh, these harsh uh, 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 um, powers of, of, of the Spanish state, because now it's, now it's not, not, not difficult because you have voted against independence. So now we can say it without uh, the fright of this leading to problems in our own countries. I think that's the, yeah. that's the question. So the way forward is to acknowledge that also international bodies have to recognize the real impact of self-determination and the rights of peoples to, to choose their own part. Yeah, well, they say there's uh, 57 varieties of socialism, and I think it's about the same in nationalism. You have ethnic nationalism and imperialism at one extent, and then you've got the kind of civic nationalism that we all support, which is uh, not ethnically based and not prejudicial or discriminatory, but is inclusive nationalism based on human rights, and that clearly has to be the way forward. But let's, let's think about where we've come in the last 100 years. 100 years ago, we were all, my, my grandfather was actually gassed in the trenches almost 100 years ago this month, and uh, 18 years old, and survived only till he was in his mid 30s. Uh, the Great War was coming to an end, and think of how Europe looked. Poland, a nation, a vibrant nation now of 40 million people, was divided between the empires of Russia, uh, uh, Germany, and Austria Hungary. Uh, and yet, you know, look how uh, things have changed dramatically. Um, uh, Czechoslovakia uh, broke away from Austro-Hungary and then in 1989 with the Velvet Divorce with Slovakia and the Czech Republic. Incidentally, there was not a majority in either the, the Czech or Slovak lands for that. The Slovak National Council just declared it. But now 90% of people on both sides believe it's a great success and it has been a tremendous success. One of the inspirational things in my life, I think, was uh, just before the, or just after the fall of the Berlin Wall when the Latvians, the Lithuanians and Estonians had been ferociously repressed uh, by Soviet communism uh, uh, with mass uh, colonization, etc., deportations to Siberia, you name it, formed a human chain across their three countries, and they soon declared independence. As someone had said 30 years ago, by the way, in three years, Latvia, Lithuania and Estonia will be independent, the Soviet Union will fall, and people would have thought you were mad. So things can happen very rapidly in politics, and things can change. What you need is to have hope. What you have to always to do is to be positive, and what you have to do is continue dialogue and to promote uh, uh, your vision. And repression never works in the long run. 
you know, Mahatma Gandhi managed to create a, an independent India that umpteen rebellions failed to achieve in the 190 years prior to that. So uh, I believe there's great hope. There's a lot of talk, a lot of uh, discussion still to go on. But the position of the Spanish state cannot hold indefinitely. And Catalonia and the people of Catalonia will have its opportunity, I believe, sooner rather than later to have a decision on whether it becomes an independent state. And I think they will vote yes. Yeah, I'm and sure. Pharaohs too. <laughs> Daniel Goa. La question is very good. It's good to have a good word. What can we do today to continue à, à se renforcer à travers euh, les actions et les organisations que nous menons. Parce que euh, la question qui est posée, elle est pour les poser à l'humanité. Quel, euh, quel sens ça a aujourd'hui de continuer à maintenir des rapports de domination dans un monde globalisé. Et je pense que cette question nous concerne là, nous, en premier lieu, mais elle concerne surtout les pays qui nous dominent. Il va donc... Euh, il va falloir que nous tissions des relations un peu plus renforcées entre les pays qui sont en, en demande d'indépendance. Et pourquoi ne pas proposer un acte qui confirmerait le travail que nous venons de faire là pendant ces deux ou trois jours ici euh, qui donnerait une impulsion à, à, à la politique que chacun de nous mène ici. Et puis, il faut que nous travaillions avec nous, et 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 que Ce sera la, la petite contribution de mon équipe là, pour euh, faire cette proposition. Et nous travaillons avec nous, et nous Merci. I have uh, one final question for Kenneth and Huckman. You are both representing European countries and Western democracy and um, states who respect law. What do you think? How could you, uh, can you, I, I know that you don't accept what we are seeing here on this poster and uh, seeing the um, violence and the jailing of people who have conducted democratic political processes in Catalonia. What is your view upon it and how can Europe and how can you as a part of the European Union, we as outside the European Union, help in creating a better solution than we are seeing today and helping in solving the problem? Or can we do anything? Do we just have to accept it? Can it first? Well, I don't think we accept anything that's again, a breach of human rights. I think what we have to do is we have to, continue, we have to lobby the Spanish uh, state. We have to support our Catalan uh, brothers and sisters. Uh, and I think we have to support human rights wherever they are, they, they, they are violated. Uh, but I think that there is an opportunity in Catalonia to move forward because, uh, uh, you know, it was uh, pointed out earlier by Carl's but that, that, that uh, the Spanish government is unstable. They will need Catalan votes for certain legislative uh, processes or the government might actually fall. In Spain, the one thing Spain uh, is completely fed up with is, would be yet another all-Spanish election process. So there's a, a window of opportunity there, there's a chink there. But we have to make it clear that Spain's long-term uh, reputation is continuing to be soiled by what is happening in Catalonia. Uh, 
Spain said to the rest of Europe once Franco died that that was a chapter in their history that was consigned to the dustbin. It's not been consigned to the dustbin, as we can clearly see. The deep Spanish state still has strong repressive tendencies, but um, we have to uh, work collectively to support uh, uh, the Catalans uh, in working against that. Ultimately, it's up to people themselves to decide their own future and not have their future decided by others. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Um, well, um, we as parliamentarians, political parties, and, and the governments of, uh, of Europe, even though we are not part of the European Union, we can, of course, raise this question in all the fora that we participate in. Um, because I think that's the only thing that will put pressure on Spain if, if, it's, if this also becomes a shame for the European countries that they, they are not protesting. And one thing we could do is, is for, for instance, in the Nordic Council, to try to raise this question. There are members of the EU and also, also members outside the EU. Uh, I think that's the only, uh, or that's the most concrete step that we could take uh, from the Faroe Islands. And also this conference and, and what you have done in this matter, Martin, that is also part of uh, lifting this into light, because if it's, if it's forgotten or suppressed also in the press and the European press, uh, I think nothing will happen. Uh, so, uh, so I think our commitment will be that we will raise it in all the international fora that we are uh, part of, of course. Can I just add, you should go on holiday to Catalonia and not to Andalusia next summer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, why not? Because economic, you know, see, in all seriousness, uh, you know, these things are important. I mean, economic pressure is always important. Do you have a comment here by, uh, by the end? Y yes, only two things uh, that I forgot to say. First, uh, our problem is with the Spanish state, not with the Spanish population. We have nothing against Spain, nothing against Spaniards or Spanish culture or Spanish products. We, we are uh, friends and we want, we want to continue to be friends and we are, we are very uh, good, we want to have a very good relationship with Spain. So that is clear. And second, I want to thank all of you who are wearing a, a yellow ribbon, uh, because that shows a solidarity uh, to the human rights. You must know where a yellow ribbon in Catalonia now is, in a, 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 is a risk. You can, you can confront some groups, kinda, a kind of guerrilla uh, musket with knives, uh, trying to remove all the yellow ribbons in the streets also, uh, in the in the, the people who are uh, wearing uh, that yellow ribbon. So I will send to my colleagues in jail your commitment to freedom and to democracy and to peace. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we have come to an end on this conference. Hagni Heidel will have a short roundup. But before uh, you are leaving the scene, I'm just telling you that tomorrow at five o'clock, in, in line with what you were saying now, there will be a cultural event at Finsen, Kommunskolanum, and it's called um, Catalonia or Otonai. Gavara so that. Catalonia Finsen, also at the Oratown or Brunalia. Tasum Virgongri Harry.
Yes, uh, I will not prolong this uh, for, for, for many more minutes, but I would also like to thank you all, uh, Daniel and Carlos and Kenneth, for your participation and all your delegations. Uh, also thank you to Magni and his staff and to our political party and to Hanna Jensen who has translated and to the staff here in the, the, the Nordic House for arranging this, uh, this conference. And I think that it's, it has been prosperous um, and as Carlos you uh, concluded with, the struggle for independence is not against other people, uh, it's a tool to cooperation and also in our opinion a tool to, or the prerequisite for a, for a peaceful and better world. And uh, as when Magni asked what, what should be done internationally, I, we are working very much with, with these new seven uh, sustainable development goals of the UN. Perhaps there should be an 18th called political and democratic sustainable development, uh, where we also add the rights for uh, also these nations that are, that are not a state yet or a republic yet to, to preserve their own destination. So with those words, I thank you very much and hope that we will meet soon again. And I look forward also to meet tomorrow. So thank you very much. Tack för att du kommer och allt det bästa framöver.